permanent director Judy Sentis, who is filling in for Director Vasilaki today. So welcome, Judy. Thank you. And I'll turn planning and development over to Chair Pendergraft. Okay, thank you. I will call the meeting to order and look for a motion to approve the agenda. Mover seconded, thank you. All in favor? Seeing the hands come up, they can go down. Opposed? Motion carries. We have two items on the agenda, one being a delegation. Uh, Michael Rupin is that individual on? Uh, ah, there he is. Yep, I'm here. Go ahead, Michael. Welcome. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I have a short presentation to share on this topic. So let me bring that up, we hope. Sure. Okay, can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to meet with you and also for the work in this matter of Chris Garish, Phil Newell and the rest of the RDOS staff. My name is Michael Rupin. I'm the director of the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory, also online somewhere. <laughs> Should be Andrew Gray, who's our operations manager. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the RAO sits is the unceded territory of the Silks of the Nagan people. So I'm here today to talk with you about DRAO and about radio inter frequency interference and why we care and why we're here today. So since there are some new faces in the room, I'll start by just going over some of the basics about DRAO. So what is the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory? Fundamentally, it's Canada's only nationally owned radio astronomy observatory, which has been in service since 1960, so for over half a century now. It's a unique radio quiet site, which is used for both open use telescopes, that is telescopes to which anyone may apply and get and observe with, and also for special purpose experiments primarily associated, primarily uh, run by uh, Canadian academic institutes. It's also an internationally recognized technical powerhouse in various different areas, particularly digital signal processing and composite antennas. Um, it's a training ground for students, all the way from local high school students to uh, graduate students and postdoctoral scholars from around Canada and around the world. And it's also the only large high-tech facility in southern British Columbia. As of 2014-2015, it was the largest employer in RDOS Area D, now Area I. Uh, bringing in over $7 million GDP annually in the RDOS, with 100 person years of employment in BC and almost 2.4 million in government revenues over that same period. I'm basing this on the study that was done of the economic impact back in 2015. We're currently in the process of a new study like that, should have the results of that in mid-October, and of course I'll be sharing them with you at that point. So that's what DRAO is in a nutshell. Why is it here? Well, the first thing, of course, we want to put a lot of telescopes onto them, on it. We want to put up a lot of telescopes. Some of them are quite large, so we needed a big flat area. But the really key point, there are lots of big flat areas. The really key point is surrounded by mountains, which blocks out radio frequency interference. So why do we care about radio frequency interference? Well, because for all the astronomy we do, a radio quiet site is absolutely essential. If you took your cell phone and put it on the moon, it would be stronger than any other cosmic source. So if you want to look at a quasar or a galaxy or distant emissions from the beginning of the universe, you better not have any cell phones around. Um, you may have seen the, all the publicity recently associated with the CHIME experiment, which is based, uh, cited at DRAO. Um, that was originally designed to do cosmology, to look at a very faint spectral line transition from near the beginning of the universe. That transition is so faint that they have to observe continuously with this telescope for five years and sum up the, the emissions from all over the sky in order to get a detection. So this stuff is really, really faint. Um, of course, when you do that, you get these fabulous results that lead to articles in Nature and got Vicki Caspi shown there in the middle uh, to be a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and all sorts of great things like that. 
But if you turn on cell phones, all that goes away. You just, you've really got to be isolated from all the man-made interference from all the technologies that we're very, that we all rely on these days, especially in the time of COVID. <clears throat> so this, this plot here just shows that's the, that's the spectrum that they're observing uh, frequency on the, on the left from 400 to 800 megahertz. And then I guess this is channel number. So basically frequency two on the bottom, but key point is bright is bad. Um, the cell phone turned on, you can see in the upper right of a second and completely swamped almost everything. There are of course all those other emissions. Uh, we filter those out as well as we can, but we do much better when there are fewer emissions to begin with. So we're really interested in keeping, a, keeping all the radio uh, waves that we rely on um, for our civilization, basically, these days, keeping them out of our telescopes and away from DRAO. So there are various protections in place, of course, for DRAO already, most obviously things like the federal land acquisitions, about 1,800 hectares, a BC order and council reserving another 400 hectares for DRAO use, supporting notations of interest, um, and of course, the 1973 land use contract, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. So I'll move on to that. You can read the rest there. So in 73, RDOS LU6D was put in place, enabling the establishment of the community of St. Andrews, subject to certain negotiated and unique conditions to protect DRAO from RFI generated by land developments and human activities. This is not really intentional emissions, right? This is just a byproduct of all the stuff that you have, like, you know, uh, microwave ovens and this kind of thing, all of them emit in the radio, and these days that's becoming more and more regular. At that point in the LUC, there were various statements such as the LUC shall be construed as running with the land, registered with the land registry, and shall inure to the benefit of and be dined upon the parties to the LUC at their respective heirs, successors, and assigned. So this is, was considered a long-term commitment. Of course, in 2014, things changed um, when the BC legislature passed Bill 17, which specifies the rescindment of all land use contracts in British Columbia by 2024, requiring a replacement with zoning. Unfortunately for us, that doesn't work too well, and we'll get as to why in a moment. Our goal in all this is enduring enforceable legal protection from RFI emissions. This complements of many of the RDOS goals in terms of the regional growth strategy and the goals listed in the OCP for sustainable economic diversification, for healthy local ecosystems, and for human settlement that is socially, economically, and environmentally friendly, which makes efficient use of the land. We greatly appreciate the stated OCP objectives and policies to minimize the levels of radio frequency on DRAO from existing development and prevent and or minimize additional RFI from potential new development, to not support future rezoning or subdivision that will intensify development in the RFI area, to require low density land use designation in lands now regulated by an LUC, and of course to support DRAO securing measures to ensure enduring legal protection and management to protect the observatory prior to discharging the LUC. So Basically, we're all in the, on the same page in this. I think we share basically the same goals. The only question is how we get there. The most obvious approach, of course, would simply be to say, well, let's extend the land use contract. Maybe there's some legal way of doing that. Who knows? Um, unfortunately, this is not sufficient for various reasons. The, the most obvious one is that the legal basis of doing so is not clear because, of course, Bill 17 says there shouldn't be any more of those. And there are various other more subtle aspects which are discussed in part in the Newell memo, which I think you've all been sent or have seen. Hard to enforce. Another big thing is that the language in the LUC is, frantic, is frankly quite antiquated. It refers to technologies that nobody uses anymore. Um, back in 1973, people didn't know about Wi-Fi, the Internet of Things, all this other stuff. So the LUC needs to be replaced anyhow. And just extending it for any substantial period would simply kick the can down the road and give everyone a false sense of security. Um, we really want to get this solved and do it right now. We shouldn't just kick the problem down the road and figure that someone else will deal with it later. 
The zoning approach is also not really applicable in this case. Uh, managing RFI is out of scope for zoning provisions. I'm sure you guys don't want to be wandering around trying to figure out what is this important interference, and if so, where it's coming from. Um, it also does not assure ongoing applicability. So, uh, to us, the approach that seems logical is to go for a provincial legislation with a strong preference for an act. Um, as compared to an ordering council or a minister's order. DRAO is here basically to seek RDOS support in securing enduring legal protection from, B, from the provincial legislature for its operations. And specifically, the stage that we're at, I'd say, is beginning regular trade discussions involving RDOS, the BC staffers, and DRAO leading immediately to an agreement on the method, in other words, how do we want to do this, and the timeline to get it done. This may, if we can't do it as fast as we like, it may involve extending the LUC as a stopgap measure, but an early long-term extension by many years would be inappropriate and would endanger the whole process. Again, that just tempts us to say, well, we'll worry about it later. You know, if, if the deadline keeps receding, it's not a real deadline and nothing ever gets done. So we're trying to avoid that. So that, that's the basics of this. The other thing I just wanted to say is that the future of DRAO is really at the moment amazing. I think if we'd had this talk a few years ago, it would not have been nearly so rosy. But at the moment, we're conducting upgrades to all our existing telescopes on site, the solar flux monitor, the GALT single dish 26 meter, that's the big dish that everyone has seen, the synthesis telescope, the set of little small dishes by the, on the railway antenna, number two, and various others that I don't have time to talk about. Um, all this activity has led to the revival of the astronomy department at UBC Okanagan, so up in Kelowna, they've hired an astronomer this year, Alex Hill, and we're hoping that they'll be hiring more because you know, those people want to work with us down at DRAO and use the telescopes and such, which is fantastic. Um, the Canadian, there was a proposal to follow up CHIME, which has been so successful, with the Canadian Hydrogen Observatory and Radio Transient Detector, CORD, CHIME, CORD, um, which is a proposal from a large number of BC academic, well, Canadian academic institutions, including UBC. Uh, this was just top ranked in the Canadian Long Range Plan for Astronomy among the mid-scale projects. That will, be, that will, if it gets funded, and hopefully we'll know about that soon, bring in something like $23 million in Okanagan. There are also major international facilities that DRAO has been working with for ages that are now approaching the time when they'll actually be funded and built. This includes the Square Kilometer Array, the Next Generation Very Large Array based in the United States, and various others. Um, SKA and NGVLA were themselves also very highly ranked in the Canadian Long Range Plan and so are considered top priorities for Canadian astronomy. And finally, I just want to mention that there is strong international interest in DRAO technologies, um, especially on, in the areas of composite dishes and digital signal processing. So the stuff we develop and build here is sort of the jumping off point for a great number of international collaborations and new instruments around the world. And of course, this also had spin-offs for Canadian industry as well, which we can talk about separately. Um, so it was really exciting at the moment. I'm looking forward to working with you guys on keeping DRAO active and making great observations for the coming years. And I just want to mention that although COVID unfortunately has thrown something of a monkey wrench into our plans to get folks out for a physical visit at some point, um, if there's interest, I'd be very happy to, to set up a virtual tour, and we've, I've also been told that we're allowed to pull out at least small groups of people for physical tours if necessary. So please let me know if you're interested in such. And I'll end there, and thank you very much, and look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks. And now okay, I thank you for that, Michael. Sharing. I do see we have a couple of questions here. I'll go to Director Canole first. Thank you very much, Michael. It's an outstanding uh, uh, facility. 
Uh, I've been to it a couple of times, and I, it's very enjoyable. I, I just absolutely love it. A um, couple of questions, though. I'm area C, so I'm just over the hill uh, from the uh, from the observatory. And I'm just wondering, are you experiencing issues now, like radio waves generally are lying to sight? So is the status quo serving you? And uh, in the future, will we require a greater area into uh, into um, containment, uh, considering the exponential growth of radio uh, controlled uh, appliances and equipment and toys and cars and you know the only thing right now that isn't radio controlled is my glasses and I'm sure that'll change by the end. Uh, 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 and yes, uh, a virtual tour would be absolutely outstanding. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'll definitely set that up. Um, so yes, the environment is getting worse rather than better. I'm sure we're familiar with that in several senses, and it's certainly true in the radio. Our best protection remains the mountains, so blocking line of sight is really critical and saves almost everything that you can. Uh, that does contain many areas, as you point out, uh, in addition to the to the St. Andrews development, though I think St. Andrews development is basically the only one that's significant and where you would think of developing anyhow. I mean, most of the areas that are line of sight are not places you would think to put down big shopping malls or houses or such in any case. So I don't. So yes, we would like to see the area extended to that area that's already been identified, that R5 protection zone. Um, I will note that such. RFI protection zones are now standard practice, basically, for all countries doing serious radio astronomy. So for instance, in Green Bank, West Virginia, in the United States, they have a, a huge exclusion zone, which I think is way beyond what we would need. Um, the SK, the square kilometer array in South Africa, per, you know, has an absolutely gigantic area as well. We don't need anything that huge, but it would be great to extend the protections to the identified RFI zone, and again, I don't think that would have much impact on development and such. And that, that's another point about the LUC. Um, the LUC has certain provisions and requirements in it which aren't really aligned with the objectives of the LUC in terms of, I think there's a proposal now to add some more developments but move them to the east rather than sticking them on top of the mountain where they're in view of DRAO, and for us that would be much better, but it requires a modification to the LUC to make possible. So. Just to follow up, if I may, uh, I'd really like to see an overlay map with the areas uh, on what uh, what areas, how it affects, uh, like my area, I'm sure Sabrina would be interested in seeing uh, yep. the yep. level of control and how much it overlays. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And I, I think I want to say that that was attached to the memo, to Bill's memo, but if not, we can certainly produce it. So, no problem. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Director Robinson, go ahead. Thank you. Um, through to the uh, presenter. Thanks for the presentation. It was awesome. Uh, I've been out there and can't, uh, it always kind of is a bit mind-blowing <laughs> getting into what you do out there. Uh, I'm just wondering out of curiosity if you're expecting 5G to have any effect on the facility. So the biggest issue, oh, okay, there are a couple of issues there. One is uh, the more digital stuff that's being done all over the place, of course, runs into us as well. And that's where we really rely on that line of sight restrictions and just keeping population density low. That's the best we can do. Um, we do apply all sorts of our own processing to the data to remove the things. And we're continually working to improve that because we know it's becoming more of a challenge. The other aspect of 5G, of course, are the mega constellations. I'm sure you've seen all the um, issues with uh, was it SpaceNet, right, with satellites, which you can then see naked eye even in some cases and certainly show up in all the optical images. Those things are also, they have uplinks and downlinks, but the downlinks are in the radio band that does affect us. And all the telescopes, all the observatories internationally are working together to negotiate with those companies, see if we can shift them around a bit in frequency, see if we can get them to turn off their transmissions when they're over you know, sites like DRAO radio telescopes, because as mentioned, those sites are always places where there aren't many people. 
So you're not gaining a lot by broadcasting huge amounts of stuff to the deer in the area, right? Um, so that's been fairly successful so far. It's still early days. We'll see how it goes. Um, but yes, yeah, we keep an eye on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Director Monteith, go ahead, please. Director Monteith, are you there? Is she muted? Yeah. She seems to be. Maybe she's not there. Your hand is up, but I'll come back to you. If need be, is there any other questions? I see leftovers from Director Robinson and Director Knodel. Of course, well, you're more than well, welcome to contact me at the phone numbers and such. It, it sure. reminds that we follow up on, on radio controlled callers for various animals. We know that right. you also. Sorry? I, I'm just wondering about radio controlled callers on, on uh -huh. animals. I think there's going to be more tracking on, on the wildlife coming up in the future. And I'm just wondering how much that has an effect on, uh, on you. I'm not sure how much they'll use in this area, but I just saw a memo that they plan on extending. To, to understand yeah. Routes. yeah, and I'd say we've just started thinking about that. The biggest threat at the moment for us, well, the two things we're concentrating on right now are, first of all, the replacement of the LUC, and second, uh, these mega constellations and their problems. The animal tracking collars, it will depend, but generally speaking, those are pretty low, um, low wattage and in a relatively confined band, but it all depends on the details, right? So we got to look at the details and understand them. But that's a good point, too. Okay, great. Uh, Director Monteith, if you're available or had a question, go ahead. Otherwise, I thank Michael for the presentation, and we'll move on with the agenda. Next item on there is the status of the land use contract, and I'll go to the CAO with that. Go ahead. Bill. Oh, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Did you have a presentation, Chris? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, Michael uh, really pointed out the difficulty is that uh, land use contracts are set to expire in 2004. We have to slap zoning on the uh, all the remaining land use uh, contract parcels by 2022, so we have to start next year. Uh, so our recommendation is that we support uh, an application to extend uh, the current land use contract, but uh, Chris will show you why. Okay. So I'm, I'm cognizant of the time, and um, fortunately, Mr. Rupin touched on it, the same thing as I was going to touch on. So I, I might go at a pretty quick uh, pace here. Um, kind of keep going to the next one. Um, so, again, this is just some basic background, which is already been touched on. I guess the key point was that the local topography was important and um, uh, seclusion from population centers. Next slide. Um, I've got a few. Yeah, so just a few quick slides on some of the development history and how we ended up with the land use contract. So by 1970, uh, at least according to the media reports at the time, uh, the board was approached by a property in the area, property owner in the area, to do a residential subdivision. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just some quick um, uh, headlines from the Herald, which I kind of show some of the back and forth that occurred at the time. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the board uh, refused two previous rezoning approvals, but subsequently changed its position. And from what I could gather from media reports, a large component of that was uh, a commitment to enter into a land use contract that would specifically address RFI. Interference issues and then that allowed for St. Andrews to proceed. Uh, next slide. Excuse, sorry, Chris. Can I just do a sound check? Is everybody here, Chris? Not very well. <laughs> I'm electronically. Sorry, Chris. I'm oh, still the same. I, 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 I was worried about that coming in here. So. Yeah, Rick um, gave a thumbs up. Rick, no, Rick gave a sort of. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll speak so louder. Yeah. yeah. We'll get, yeah, we'll get a Chris better. a megaphone. In the <laughs> <laughs> I think it's got like this. No, it's uh, this little green. Okay, so for the um, for the benefit of the board members who may not be familiar with land use contracts, um, it, it, it is, as the name suggests, a contract which uh, has more guarantees than zoning. 
there was a short term thing in place in the 1970s, uh, but to enact them, you had to go through the normal steps of any rezoning, multiple readings, public hearings, et cetera. Next slide, please. So LU60 was adopted in 1973, and there's really two components to it. Uh, the first one was the authorization of what was referred to as the St. Andrews Recreation Development. Uh, it essentially authorized the golf course and 150 residential units. Uh, the second component was everything to do with regulating RFI uh, interference uh, in association with assistance from the observatory. <coughs> Next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of the residential development, um, and again, in, in reflection of RFI considerations, the, the contract sets out very specific locations that development could occur. Uh, it numbers them 1A through up to 7. Um, and th this, again, is to ensure minimization of RFI. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, this is just a context slide to give an indication. The trail is about 2 kilometers southeast of uh, the main clubhouse and golf course. And of course, you can see that in relation to OK Falls here. Next slide, please. Uh, so some of the uh, RFI provisions uh, contained within the contract, which we find difficult from a zoning perspective, uh, relate to uh, cabling, uh, how it's to be buried and sheathed. Uh, although our building inspectors do look for this uh, when approving building permit applications up at St. Andrews. Next slide, please. Some of the other challenging ones, though, are the regulations that prohibit um, amateur radio equipment, walkie-talkies, fluorescent lights, uh, microwaves, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, carrying on from that, the contract also prohibits the use of um, uh, trail bikes, snowmobiles, dune buggies. Again, difficult from the zoning perspective to regulate. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then in terms of um, what we've previously been advised as an unlawful or potentially unlawful delegation of board authority, the contract purports to give DREO uh, enforcement capability on lands on behalf of the board uh, at uh, St. Andrews, which we think is difficult. Um, next slide, please. Um, that said, uh, outside of the land use contract, and again, as Mr. Rubin indicated, the board has taken another, a number of other steps uh, through the Littoral Area C and Littoral Area I official community plan and zoning bylaws. Uh, there's some very supportive policies and objectives. Uh, we have regulations that uh, reduce minimum parcel sizes for subdivision, which actually increases them, limits density of dwelling units, and certain types of uses. Next slide, please. Um, and um, this, just, this is just a screenshot showing the, the extent of uh, the radio frequency interference area. This is drawn from the area I OCP. So you can see it's not just uh, St. Andrews area. It extends as far south as Twin Lakes and then down into the Willowbrook area right, in area C. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this has already been touched on. Land use contracts are coming to an end very shortly. Next slide, please. Um, so with, with this termination of the contract upon us, um, the ministry's provided the board with a, an option uh, to potentially extend the contract. Um, and again, as Mr. Rupin indicated, uh, there are challenges with that from a staff perspective with the regional district. Um, one of the main concerns is that the contract itself only applies to approximately 2.6% of the RFI area. So extending the contract doesn't address uh, how the remainder shall be protected going forward. Um, we've already touched on the difficult language, antiquated language contained in the contract. Itself. Um, the other issue too is that um, you know the contract contemplates development occurring in certain locations that you know with the benefit of 50 years of hindsight and experience working up there may not be the best location. The OCP, and I've, I've circled it in red here, is actually encouraging development to go to a different location not contemplated by the contract. Um, so you know this fourth dot point I have here, uh, a challenge is the existing subdivision potential up at uh, St. Andrews, even though it's been in place for 47 years, there's still unfinished uh, phases representing about 54 units. Um, the contract requires those at the western part of the parcel. Ideally, however, we'd like to see those relocated in the eastern part. Uh, so extending the contract might present a problem in that, in that context. Uh, next. And we also have an active subdivision application, which ironically uh, we feel is, is, is Good proposal, uh, but it's inconsistent with the land use contract. So again, extending the land, land use contract to present a challenge with respect to that, that, that particular application. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so all, all that being said, we see that there's basically three options before the board. Um, the option to support a short-term extension, uh, no extension at all, which would be the status quo, 
for a permanent extension. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, staff is recommending a, a, a qualified short-term extension of not more than five years uh, to June 30th, 2029 be supported. Uh, we feel that this will allow for additional time for negotiations between federal, provincial, and local government uh, to discuss potential replacements uh, for the RFI and our respective roles in that. Um, that said, uh, it's still early days, so we don't, we're not quite clear what, what that replacement legislation or uh, regulation would look like. Uh, we envision having to come back to the board to seek input on that. Um, and if the contract is supported for a short-term extension, we feel that um, uh, we're probably looking at having to undertake an amendment uh, to the contract in order to facilitate those remaining uh, subdivision phases that haven't been completed yet. Uh, next slide, please. The other two options that are available to the board, um, so if no extension is supported, uh, there is a risk that with the termination of the contract upon us that uh, even though the, the protections in the contract are, are challenging to work with, they, they are protections to a degree, but they would disappear. And it's also not clear when or if uh, replacements would ever be enacted. And if a permanent extension would be, be supported, um, it, it would essentially be entrenching the contract. We, we feel as many challenges. And again, would not address the remainder of the RFI area. So, you know, those are the three options. Uh, I think that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Otherwise, and that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't know whether that was a leftover hand from Director Monteith, but I'll try her first. To the chair, can I be heard now? Yes. Uh, I've had gotcha. difficulties. Sorry. Um, I have had a chance to review this with staff and, and had had discussions with um, several residents out at St. Andrews, and I am very familiar with Dreo, and I, I do agree with where um, administration is going with this in that there has to be a solution somehow, some way to both protect Dreo as well as allow for appropriate development in the right areas. And I do feel that um, some time is necessary. So I would like to make the administrative recommendation, please. Okay, it's being moved. Is there a seconder for that? I'll see a seconder, thank you. And uh, any other questions concerning this? Director Canole? Yeah, I'm not sure Michael's still with us, but I'm just wondering if it'd be, uh, if there's a mechanical solution to uh, this problem that may be implemented. I know they can block cell phone signals in, in whether we get to a point where that would be sufficient for, for, for his purposes. Go ahead, Michael. Okay. So, unfortunately, I mean, if we knew of such a solution, we'd certainly be going after it ourselves, and we'd also make enormous amounts of money. <clears throat> which would be great. Um, but I don't think there's anything that one can apply that sort of can nuke all the possible signals. In many cases, it's because they're not signals that anyone wants to have. They just come from the fact that when you're switching things back and forth rapidly, as you are in much digital electronics, it's spread across a wide spectrum. And you only care about it in the little region that you're looking at. But of course, we care about it in all, all the junks that are around, if you like. Um, so, I'm, I'm not sure that that seems an unlikely solution in the end. I wish it were not so. And of course, we and many others are looking into that or studying that carefully, but we haven't found a magic bullet yet. Okay, thank you for that. Any further questions or Director discussion? Roberts. Mm -hmm. Director Roberts, go ahead. Yeah, to the chair, thanks. Um, just a quick question, because looking at the map and hearing that the uh, line of sight and that also Twin Lakes affects it, it is the possibility or the movements for other um, development in the Twin Lakes area a concern as well? Can you answer yeah, that, Chris? I don't have. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. I would 
have to look at that. I'm afraid I don't have that at my fingertip. Andrew probably does, but I see he's, I think he's watching by YouTube rather than directly. So I'll have to get back to you on that. Do you answer that, Chris? Yes, sir. Well, yeah, I, I, we're not aware of any of the current developments at Twin Lakes occurring within the RFI area. Uh, okay. There are obviously privately held lands at Twin Lakes that are within that area, and you can never tell which what, what application tools we might come forward in the future. Okay, so it's an issue to be dealt with potentially in the future. Anything further? Seeing no further hands, we'll call the question on the motion. All in favor? Hands are going up. You could take them down, please. Opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody, and with that, we'll adjourn. Excellent. Thank you. We're going to go straight into environment and infrastructure, and I'll turn that over to Chair Bush. Go ahead, Chair Bush. So I'll bring the Environment and Infrastructure Committee to order. Um, Somebody uh, move the agenda. Okay, second. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Um, we have a delegation, CAO. Uh, I believe we're just going to hear from Sarah Boyle on the Parks Canada uh, process, running our Mr. Chair. So we'll just bring her in. Okay, is Sarah available? Yes, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm not sure who. Sarah's got a wingman here. Yeah. <laughs> and Keith, you're on the call as Keith. well? So, uh, yeah, so Keith Barrick, I'm the. Yes, I'm on the call. And, and uh, we have Chief, Chief uh, Keith Crow from the Orson Mill Community Indian Band on the call as well. Uh, I was wondering, are uh, there any municipal leads, Mayor Johansson or Mayor, uh, any of the mayors from Karamea and Usoyas on the call as well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I will um, um, thank you very much. I think everyone has the um, has the handouts that were provided ahead of time, and that's a copy of the letter that was sent out to residents, as well as a draft uh, a, a draft copy of the previous actions and notes from the last meeting in December that we had with the regional district. Um, I have right now here. I'm going to. I haven't used WebEx to present. I just have a. Um, uh, am I able to sh uh, practice yesterday with Danny? Danny, how do uh, I share my screen? Thank you. I'm now the presenter. All right. So I just wanted to give, uh, can everyone see the, the PowerPoint slide? No. Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Is there a bit of a lag time? Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, what I'm proposing for today is to uh, give an update on the negotiations process, an update on the letter to residents and the type of kind of feedback and, and, and what we heard back, um, to do a quick review of the past notes and actions from the regional district meeting that I mentioned copies of, as well as to talk about next steps and meeting preferences moving forward um, for uh, for for working together with the regional district as well as um, as well as the uh, town count mayor and council of the different municipalities in the South Okanagan and Milkami, and then have time for other questions. Does that sound good to everybody? Okay, so I don't have anything too fancy prepared. Um, what I really wanted to um, go through right now was to give you a quick update on the negotiations process. Uh, and where we are right now is Perks Canada the province of British Columbia. And um, I'm just going to stop sharing my content for a moment. Um, so where we are right now uh, is in negotiations is that the, the main focus is on is on First Nations issues, including employment, training, contracting, dispute resolution, uh, contribution based ecotourism, 
sustainable tourism, uh, and exploring ways ultimately that the Six Nation and Perks Canada uh, land management systems can, can coexist with one another if we move forward and uh, we move forward um, and, and looking at cooperative management. And that was all shared in the recent update that uh, we'll, we'll go over as well in the letter to residents. Um, we have been getting lots of questions on, you know, when are we going to be looking at grazing? What's happening with water and helicopter access? So first, we really need to deal with um, the first nation, the, the, the issues that I was speaking about with the Silks Nation, uh, as, as well as the province of BC. Uh, and upon that point, then we can focus to other provisions related to land management, including grazing and water management, mining and boundary adjustments. And at that point, the appropriate representatives and impacted stakeholders will be updated on progress and engaged in discussions as appropriate. Um, and one of the, the items that I believe Director Pendergraft has, has been, has been um, trying to push Parks Canada for, which we are completely open to, is that when those, when those discussions begin, that Parks Canada is open to have uh, a regional district lead present if the if the impacted stakeholder so desires so um that was something i wanted to make really clear this is uh we're dealing with a lot of big issues there's uh it, it, these things take some time i know everyone is anxious for things to move forward but um we need to take the time to do it right and we are open to when we get to the to the appropriate point to impacted stakeholders to, for them to uh to engage with their local director or municipal leader um, should they so desire. So um, that's kind of really what I wanted to, to open with in terms of the update on negotiations process. Keith or Chief Crow, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? I'll let you speak up if, if you do. Elsewise. This is Keith Barrick from, it's Keith from BC Parks. Uh, no, a good summary, Sarah. Um, yeah. I'm on hand here to answer any questions that are relevant to uh, provincial scope on this important project. Okay, and I anticipate I'll, I'll give this presentation and then we'll take questions at the end. Is, is that how uh, preferred format from the Committee of the Whole? I think so. Okay. Okay. Great. So next I'm going to share um, my screen now. See if this works. Uh, I think this should work. You should see a copy of the update that was sent out to the letter to residents that was sent out to August. You should see a, a letter in front of you. So for those of you, um, we, we did uh, send this out. We tried to have a very wide net. Um, we have a email update list of a I think just over 3,000 people that received this. We also worked with a, um, Staples to do a mail drop for residents uh, that had postal codes uh, within and close to the proposed National Park Reserve boundaries. And so uh, this was essentially going over an update, uh, background on the MOU, which we signed uh, last, last year, last July. Um, providing a little bit more information on what a working boundary is and what does it mean. Um, doesn't affect land, lands and private land that would not be subject to the Canada National Parks Act. Um, we heard quite loud and clear during the public consultations that a revised map was needed that was a bit simpler. So we included that as well. I'll, I'll show that at the end. Um, we go through highlights of the MOU. Uh, that are really pertinent to to uh, the community. And then we talked to, as well as what is new, an update on the negotiations, uh, as well as um, as well as uh, letting folks know that we have been meeting with regional government, that there was a request to have a round table with municipalities and um, and that we are willing to do so and, and um, would like to, yeah, would like to continue that and, and, and figure out the appropriate, uh, avenue to do so. Uh, we also asked if uh, residents could contact myself to let them know if we, they will still want us to be sending mail to their their, um, their house at, the, at their address. So we did ask people to self-identify 
uh, as well. So that was kind of the, the overview of that. And I'll show right now the updated map. We might uh, reduce this. So essentially what we did for this updated map is, um, I don't know if you remember previous maps had provincial crown lands, uh, provincial protected areas and private lands all differentiated in the park. And it made a bit of a mosaic that was hard for people to, to look at. So what we did is within this working boundary, um, we just took all crown lands that include uh, provincial crown lands and provincial protected areas uh, and put them green. So we molded them together. So the lands in green in question are the lands that are, are up for for um, becoming a part of the proposed National Park Reserve. So um, what we heard in terms of uh, response and review is we get the varied, the varied supportive versus the very opposition. But in terms of tangible, um, tangible feedback, uh, lots of people were interested in staying informed, supportive or opposed. And um, lots of people kind of gave us feedback that they didn't like the the getting a letter, uh, they'd rather have a flyer um, and so that they don't need to go through any any permissions. So we'll be looking to revamp how we are doing mail drops as well to make it a more accessible because we understand that during COVID some people are <coughs> and stuff just went into the recycling as well. So that's certainly not what we want. So we're going to look at um, streamlining, streamlining uh, updates, making them uh, one or two pagers and, and then and then um, using them as flyers as opposed to at letters addressed to people. And next steps include um, really us, uh, yeah, we're looking to do updates on a, a quarterly to, to, uh, to biannually, um, to biannually updates or when there's, there's some significant new information to share. So that is uh, what we have on the letter to updates with the update to residents. Uh, I will now, uh, now move to the summary of our last, uh, sorry, I've somehow lost my WebEx ability to, to share. So if I switch to, the meeting summary between regional directors in December. Uh, do you see that or do I have to share that screen specifically? Oh, we can see it. You can see it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so this is a meeting summary. It's still in draft form um, from December. And at this point, we have met with strictly regional uh, district directors, including the chair, Carla. And um, and at that point in time, Christopher Garish and uh, Brad weren't invited, but we did decide at the group that they should be included going forward. And that was a meeting between myself and Keith Derrick with BC Provincial Parks. Um, I won't belabor a lot of this. Uh, what we have highlighted in yellow are, are the new additions based on feedback that I've heard back and forth. I think going up until COVID hit March and April from directors, Pendergraft and, and, and Nodal as well. So really, you know, these these meetings, what are what what you know, Parks Canada and, and BC Provincial Parks and intent is, um, is that this will provide an avenue to interact regarding future planning on regional management issues related to the proposed National Park Reserve, and that's that's in in this document as well. Um, the intent of these meetings is that it'll provide provide a platform to review negotiations proceedings with directors. And, and now um, mayors from Penticton, Osoyoos, Oliver, and Karameus, and obtained feedback and input on matters important to the constituents in the South Okanagan with regards to the proposed National Park Reserve. And we, we also have a, a very good understanding of this from our public consultation. We um, got a massive amount of feedback on that. So we have a good idea of the issues, but we wanna make sure that those are moving forward and that we're keeping current and. Um, engaging with elected officials and leaders on that. And so at the, at the point in time, we were looking to regularize meetings um, between RDOS, BC Parks and Parks Canada. Um, and that would be an opportunity to review um, input and provide uh, 
and, and provide inclu inclusion of RDUS planning manager, Christopher Garish, as well. So that's kind of the, the overall in, intent of, of these meetings moving forward. And, um, and uh, you know, we had, you can, you can read that. I think everybody has a copy of this. Uh, but really, these meetings are meant to provide as, a, as, a, as an avenue to, to share information moving forward and to develop relationships. Um, one of the items that we did talk about uh, moving forward is that RDOS directors will have opportunities going forward that can inform the negotiations process. And uh, during that meeting, there was already a lot of brainstorming happening, including development of integrated pest management plan. Um, to act as a filter screen along agricultural lands. I think that was Director no uh, Nodell um, participating on a working committee and collaborative board uh, to address economic and environmental damages, um, emergency response uh, collaboration, harmonization of fishing permits between provincial and federal lands, and inclusion of a dark sky preserve. So, uh, yeah, the, it was a really productive meeting. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we can we can link back into that again. Uh, so really, one of the outstanding comments was um, making sure that regional directors are uh, that their their constituents and their impacted stakeholders know that they are available to come and participate in any discussions that happen with Merck's with Parks Canada and Parks Canada and and, uh, and the province were, were both open to, to representatives to include their RDOS directors if the representative desired. So that was really the, um, the gist of uh, what I wanted to talk about there, which leads into um, my next question is in terms of now that we're in the era of of COVID, what what I maybe I can open the discussion is what would be the best way to continue these conversations? Is it through committee of the whole? Um, could we continue to meet um, over over WebEx uh, with regional directors uh, for updates on this? Should we look at including municipal leaders? As well in that, or should we be having a separate separate roundtable for municipal leaders? So I'm really looking for feedback from the committee of the whole on direction on how you would uh, like to see this organized going forward. So does anybody have any uh, any feedback to offer? Um, Director Canola, you have a question. In regards to carrying on, uh, I, I believe that we'll have to set an example as laid out by the province uh, and continue these meetings in uh, in their virtual realm. <coughs> and I also, uh, it's just plain healthier. Uh, I'm sure that some of the municipal leaders at this point would be very interested in carrying on uh, with with these getting involved in these discussions too. But going forward into the future, I have a list of other things, but I'll, I'll let uh, well let's get this one out of the way first before we. Okay. Yeah, no. uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say yeah. If we could, if we could capture that and then move on, open the floor to other questions as well. So it would be good to to kind of uh, land on um, a plan that works for everyone in terms of moving forward. <clears throat> Director Ober. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, there we go. Thank you to the chair. Um, my, my feedback and my question is um, I'm not on the list of directors who have been included previously. <laughs> And on behalf of Area D, uh, I would like to be included. Uh, our community is very interested in the national park being updated and, and participating. And, and so my question is, would, would it be possible to get on that list and to participate? Thank you. Uh, uh, I, from Perks Canada's perspective, that, that isn't an issue. Um, Keith, how about from the provincial perspective?
Keith Barrett. Yeah, sorry, just fiddling with the mute button there. Uh, no, that, no issue with that. That's, that's, that's fine. And chair of RDOS, Carla. Uh, I think we need to decide if it's the majority of the board want to participate, then I would think we would continue with the committee of, of the whole. The, the previous group that met in December were the directors that the, are uh, directly in the area of the proposed park, as well as myself as chair. So that's what that subcommittee was. So we, we need to figure this out. If it's the majority of the board that want to participate, then I would suggest that we carry on with the whole board. But um, let's hear from a few others. Okay, who's next? Uh, Director Roberts. Thank you to the chair. Um, I'm supporting moving forward with WebEx and uh, secondary to that is that it is important that a voice of those directors, I believe, that have their constituents living within the park boundaries that uh, there needs to be a format that they don't get drowned out in regards to uh, over encompassing views and opinions. So whether or not there's you know a, a process um, as there has been uh, moving forward, but I'm I'm definitely again a supportive of the uh, uh, WebEx format. Okay, so lots of names going up now. Um. <laughs> Director Gettins. Oh, sorry, I didn't know my hand was up. Pardon me? She took her hand off. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Petra, you want to go ahead? Hi, Sarah. It's um, Petra from Oliver. And so I would just, I think that both formats are probably important moving forward. Um, obviously, WebEx seems to be the way to go. Uh, but a forum for both the um, regional district directors to continue to receive updates and participate. Um, maybe at USB Rec suggested either quarterly or biannually, but also a place for the directly adjacent um, municipalities and the directly affected directors to um, have their round table uh, back in I think it was the fall when Mayor Johansson and I met with you and Oliver. Um, we spoke at that time about having a round table with um, sort of the, the Oliver Estius Caramius area. Um, and we're looking forward to that happening. Okay, so um, any further questions? Uh, Director Canoto, did you have some more questions? Yeah, I'm just supporting uh, Director Roberts on the idea that uh, on the thought that <clears throat> those who are directly involved in this or directly affected by it, uh, we could easily get drowned out by the the, the pro anti uh, argument, and that's not the point to this uh, of the directors that are adjacent to the park or involved in the park being involved in this. Uh, we have a separate group of communication issues. Uh, some of my upcoming questions will show and uh, you know we don't want to enter into the pro or anti park argument that's not part of our format it's making sure that our uh, residents are well protected as opposed to uh, getting involved in the, the other discussion thank you okay so is there any further questions for us uh, either Sarah or Eric or Keith Barrett So, Director Knodel, go ahead. We can't hear you, Rick. So, Rick, you must be on mute. Still on mute. Try again. <laughs> Can you take him off then? There. There you go. Hi. So I fumble with this like everyone else. Uh, if we're moving out of the, the format portion, I do have a list of questions that I'd like to have uh, Sarah take back with her and uh, consideration for a future meeting. Uh, it's, it's unfair to, to ask her to answer these 
uh, out some research, uh, and they do involve uh, the areas that are involved in uh, to the parks. Uh, of course, a big one is, uh, it, if that's the case, I'll carry on with this. A big one would be the fire reporting. Um, that's, uh, in light of the Christie Mountain fire, I have to make it clear that Christie Mountain been inside this proposed park, but the chills would look considerably different today, along with possibly a good chunk of East uh, Penticton. There is a war aware that there is a delay involved with the reporting. Uh, our first meeting was at a fire hall that, uh, where she explained reporting procedure for uh, wildfire in national parks area. And I will lay that out further in, in a, a document to the, the chair to the board. Uh, and I was also uh, see that the board forwards these things to, to Sarah. Uh, it's a very positive picture on the MOU, and, and uh, to that end, uh, Chief Louie had the letter out on that, and I'll make that available to the, the board too. Uh, and I'm sure Chief Crow has uh, uh, some issues that he would like to, to express too. But those, the, the native issues are being dealt with at this point from my understanding. So it's, it's not for us to, to involve ourselves there. One of the other things that uh, came up our meeting, there's 71 mineral claims in the proposed national park area, and that uh, creates a sig significant amount of total area. Uh, and it's been stated that it will not be uh, dragged into the national park. It won't be expropriated. Um, but that's, uh, uh, to this end, the National Park uh, Engagement Report only indicates that two uh, of the uh, claim holders has been, have been approached, and I've talked to a number of the claim owners uh, in this area, and they are not aware of this agreement. Uh, so they're a little concerned about that because 1.5.2 uh, of the Canada Park Act kind of puts them uh, up for expropriation, which is allowed in the formation of a national park. It's excluded for any native concerned lands. So from that point of view, uh, you know, the, the trust issue is kind of like the scorpion and the frog. I, I'm not about to, to uh, you know, have the scorpion on my back until we've satisfied the, the trust issue on expropriation. Uh, and that's, that's something going forward that we'll have to, to deal with. Creation is allowed uh, under 1.4.6 of the NPA. In particular, it's allowed for Mining Act uh, uh, activities. Uh, it's not allowed for 1.410 through 12 uh, for anything that is under claim by the natives. So they're already included uh, in this. So that's, uh, that's part of it. Uh, then, of course, the grazing rights issue. Uh, I have a document here from the OPSPS uh or pardon me osps newsletter that, uh is uh quite negative on the grazing uh with creation of a national park in the south open Harbor, some things that go into the area would have to be limited or eliminated livestock grazing would have to be reduced in order to meet objectives for the ecological integrity and hunting and mining and off-road recreation or activities that would have to come to it if the national park was formed. That's obviously going to come up numerous times in the ongoing discussions when we finally get to the, the point that deals with uh, other than native uh, concerns on this. Uh, furthermore, drawing a circle around the various mineral claims, this is the 18th richest mineralized area in BC out of 770 areas according to the uh, Association of Mineral Engineers. Um, so with these 71 claims, uh, I, I see the, the natives would be derelict in their duty to their members to uh, not be getting involved in that and, and making sure that they had a stake in any mining that goes on in this area. Uh, so I, I see that coming up uh, as, uh, as one of their um, issues. I think I'll leave it at that. I know we're going to go forward, but I do strongly suggest that everyone starts reading a little more of the paperwork that's out there. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, Sarah, did you have any response for that? Or should we move on to another question? Um, I will, um, I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take Rick's note that uh, he's going to give me some time to, to come forward and present this. It sounds like we're getting the agenda laid for a future meeting. Um, but uh, I will let the, the board know that we are undergoing a mineral valuation analysis. We're contracting in the process of contracting out a third party that has been communicated to um, uh, the major mineral hold claimers and uh, the remaining of those, uh, I think there's 15 in total of who own those 81 actual mineral claims, Rick. And uh, um, yeah, it's been, it's, uh, so we're, we're moving forward to, to get what, uh, yeah, what the actual valuation of those looks like as well. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll have something in the next few months to report back on. Uh, and then fire, I think that's a whole, whole discussion unto itself, but Parks Canada does, uh, would be, you know, talking with the, the Rob Ushovi at the leader of the Southeast Fire Center, they, and, and talking to, did talk to the fire, um, fire chiefs in Penticton and Sunderland, uh, and everyone looked at having more fire resources as a positive, um, and each, each area is managed, uh, based on what its fire risk is. And we all know the Okanagan and Similkameen have a, a lot of fire risk. Uh, and working with particularly Lower Similkameen Indian Band, making sure that um, that traditional ecological knowledge and those traditional fire practices is, are really, really integrated as well. So there's lots of exciting work moving forward on that. Uh, but yes, I will uh, take some, that's kind of the, the Coles Notes response. There, Lots of more good conversation on that, uh, but we can move on to other questions. Okay, uh, Director McCordo. Um, yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Sarah, for um, continuing to, pro to provide updates and listening to people's concerns. This started in 2002 when the first uh, Parks Canada came to the town of Vesuvius looking at how we could make uh, this work. So it's been 18 years so far that <clears throat> we've been dealing with it. Um, <clears throat> we certainly in, uh, in the town of Vesuvius had a concern and I think that it's been, um, a letter has been sent to, um, to Sarah about the boundary. Um, uh, just a very small area that we were concerned about, but we certainly do appreciate having um, um, Sarah uh, accept an invitation to come and speak to um, to the Asuias Council. I am always um, available to meet with um, with uh, mayors and regional directors. And if the best way to do that is through the RDOS, then I'm um, I'm certainly in favor of that as well. So I'm a strong proponent of of the national park. Always have been. And I, I think that you've done an amazing job of so far of listening to people's concerns and, um, and continuing to deal with them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Um, Sarah, did you have anything else to add? No, thanks, Sue. And um, yes, uh, I haven't received the letter yet, but I have, taught, I have been in conversation with Gina and uh, we'll look to also get, um, we'll also let, you, this is this has also had some provincial crown land uh, authorities on it so we're going to have to involve linrod as well so but once i talk to gina we'll get something sorted and make sure the appropriate representative is, is available from linrod as well okay, yeah. thank you i'd like to ask uh, chief keith crow if he had, wants to add uh, to this discussion keith are you there So Keith, either if you're not there, either you're muted or you're not there. So sorry about that. Oh, I'm, I'm on my phone actually. I'm not on the computer. I didn't know I had to turn it off on the computer here. So sorry about that. Uh, no, I don't okay. have much to add. I just wanted to be part of the hearing what's being said and uh, any concerns that came up. That's the one reason why I wanted to be on this call. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Keith. Um, 
So Sarah, I'm Director Bush for the Coston area. And uh, my major concern is probably the loss of food sovereignty for our area. Um, the way I look at it, we're gonna lose 100% uh, of this land is food producing land, whether it's grazing or hunting. And eventually it's gonna be a loss for our area and it's a big concern for our residents. So just wanna mention that again. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, Keith, Barrick, did you have any closing statement? I think Sarah did a good job summing it up and just taking some notes here of what uh, the director said. It's coming out and just making making some notes. So good, good stuff. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah and Keith. And uh, we'll be moving on to C, large item collection reschedule. Yeah. CAO. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. and thanks, Mr. Chair. So uh, this is just for information, but uh, Mr. Reader uh, wanted to have an opportunity to uh, make sure the board is aware of uh, the, the rescheduling of the bulky item pickup, and then if they have any questions, I'm sure you can answer. Good morning, Andrew. Uh, go ahead. Um, thank you. So uh, essentially the large item pickup um, that we had uh, scheduled for the spring uh, was delayed because of the COVID uh, issues. At that time, uh, we weren't uh, safely able to uh, collect the items. Uh, at this point in time, we've resolved those issues with the contractor and uh, I provided a schedule that's part of the board report um, that folks can look at um, where we will be rescheduling for the fall. All the items that we usually pick up uh, will be picked up this uh, fall. So that's coming up in October, fairly short order. Great. Thank you very much. And so I believe that's the end of... Um... Uh, were there any questions, Mr. Chair? Oh, you... any, any questions for Andrew? Okay, seeing none, I think we can be adjourned. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Chair Bush. We're going to go right into Corporate Services Committee. Have a look at your agendas, please. I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda. Moved by Director Pendergraf. Seconded by Director Roberts. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll go to the first item, item B. 2020 year-end meeting schedule for information, CAO. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Gender change. Uh, so, uh, everybody knows that uh, it's a regulatory requirement uh, for local governments to be on a calendar year. So, we get very busy in uh, the fall, uh, mostly with uh, budgeting and strategic planning. Uh, just getting uh, ready to ease out of one year into the next and making sure that we have uh, a roadmap of where uh, we want to go. So uh, what uh, we want to do is to have uh, all of our members commit uh, some dates, in, uh, uh, mostly throughout November. Uh, we're already working administratively on uh, budget and strategic planning. Uh, we'd like to get uh, into uh, workshops uh, with the board in uh, early November. So uh, you can see from the schedule that was sent out with the agenda that we uh, want to kick this off on uh, uh, Thursday, November 5th and Friday, November 6th. So we have the Ombudsman and the Privacy Commissioner scheduled to appear. So they're, uh, they'll uh, actually be in person uh, and we're going to schedule those two meetings for the Lakeside Hotel so that we can get the amount of room necessary uh, for all of our members uh, to get together. Uh, we know this has been frustrating for you throughout the uh, COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, it's always much better to see each other in person, uh, even though you can't hug each other anymore. Uh, from your six feet of distance, you can uh, do a virtual uh, fist bump. Uh, and uh, we believe that uh, 
if we can get the presentations from the Ombudsman and the Privacy Commissioner in the morning uh, of the 5th, then you can have your inaugural meeting uh, that afternoon. We need a bit of a break between, uh, we'll have a presentation set up for those uh, two speakers and then we'll need to get into a, a board meeting uh, structure for the afternoon. Uh, so that would be the inaugural meetings for both the uh, regional district board of directors and the hospital uh, district board of directors. Uh, we won't be planning any sort of a reception uh, for you this year just because of the uh, COVID-19 requirements. And hopefully it doesn't go as badly as they expect this fall with uh, the combined pandemic and flu season. But nevertheless, uh, I, don't, I don't believe any of the distancing restrictions are going to be relieved. Uh, by November. So uh, we'll schedule those for the Lakeside. Uh, we'll get uh, those that can be in attendance in attendance. We'll still have uh, the capability for uh, uh, teleconferencing or uh, virtual meetings. I know that uh, some of our members are, are still uh, in sort of a vulnerable position. They won't want to attend in, in uh, person. So uh, we'll have uh, uh, virtual capabilities for them as well. So on the Friday, uh, we want to, again, just go through our normal legislative workshop uh, types of things. We want to talk about the procedure bylaw. Uh, it's our understanding we'll have a few new members. Uh, so we'll want to invite uh, um, uh, uh, or welcome them into the group and make sure that uh, they get the opportunity for a bit of an orientation. I uh, haven't uh, completely worked out the agenda for that with uh, Ms. Malden yet. Uh, if there is time, uh, I'd like to get going on strategic planning uh, with the board, but if not, then uh, we'll schedule that for the uh, next day. So here's what we want you to do. Uh, we want Thursday, November 5th and Friday, November 6th. We want Thursday, November 12th and Friday, November 13th uh, for a combination of strategic planning and budgeting. Uh, we want Thursday, uh, November 19th, and Friday, November 20th. Again, uh, well, the, the 19th is your regular board meeting, um, uh, but the 20th for either strategic planning or budgeting. I um, haven't completely worked that out yet. It's just, it, it's important for us to go through the strategic planning discussions before we get into budget uh, so that we know what projects uh, specifically we need to budget for. And as we always say, whatever uh, goes in the budget has to be in the work plan and whatever goes in the work plan has to be in the budget so that we can manage that capacity box, uh, making sure that uh, we meet uh, as many of your expectations as we can. And then uh, we, we will probably need uh, that Thursday of the 26th uh, for either strategic planning or budgeting. Uh, so we'd like you to book that as well. Uh, we'll see how we go as we proceed through those uh, uh, the, those November meetings. If we need some more dates in December, uh, we should be able to uh, identify those early enough uh, that you can get them into your calendar. Uh, but uh, as you can see, November will be intense. Uh, so um, that's the proposal at this point, Madam Chair. Okay, great. Thank you. So are there any questions or comments? on this proposed schedule. Uh, yes, Director Canolo, go ahead, please. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about attending the ones that are, are being held at the lakeside. I'm going to assume that they will be uh, a video cast also. Uh, in November, I'm, I've am got a funny feeling I'm going to be very cautious about uh, uh, stepping out the door, basically. I just want to make sure that I can participate in one manner or another. Yeah, uh, Danny's shaking his head over there, Director Knodel, so uh, we're going to uh, hook you up. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And go ahead, Director Santos. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to comment that as I entered uh, these dates into my calendar, they uh, certainly are working well with what the City of Penticton uh, will be doing and they've given us some tentative dates because ours will be as heavy as the RDOS. So at this point, uh, we're looking like we'll be compatible. So thank you. 
and uh, we'll congratulate uh, Ms. Maldon for that because she has been working with the corporate officers from all of our six member municipalities uh, to make sure that uh, our calendars didn't overlap. Yeah, it's easier to do it in advance. Than on <laughs> yeah, <the calendar>. <laughs> Great, thank you, Christy. Anybody else have a comment on this before we move on? Uh, Director Monteith, go ahead, please. To the chair, can I ask about strategic planning and what it would look like? Um, I know last year I felt that a lot of our strategic planning was very exterior from what our capabilities were at the regional district. And I kind of felt that at times we were lost maybe in, in planning much larger things than we were capable of taking care of within our regional district. And I'm wondering if maybe our strategic planning to be more tailored to our specific region versus thinking so globally. Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, sounds like a good plan. Uh, so always the challenge when we get into strategic planning is uh, um, sometimes our eyes are bigger than, uh, uh, than our stomachs. So uh, we tend to be quite optimistic as to uh, the projects that we want to undertake uh, and then uh, either we run into problems where we need to involve other agencies that we rely on or grants or uh, that uh, something happens during the year like a pandemic or or a, a fire and or a flood and uh, we don't accomplish what we set out to do but that always is the, chan uh, the, the challenge and a plan uh, really is just a plan uh, uh, I mean, uh, we try and set out uh, based on our forecast as much as we uh, to be reliable as it can be, but uh, uh, no guarantees. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Director Gettens, go ahead, please. Thank you to the chair. If there's something we would like to have on the strategic plan, is it best just to email um, Christy and just let her know, or should we be bringing it to the board prior to our first strategic planning workshop? Uh, the earlier we know, the better. Um, I'll tell you at this point, uh, we have uh, the administrative team uh, identifying sort of what they know about. Uh, and uh, we'll put that together as much as we can. Uh, and then uh, we would bring that in and uh, uh, we'll add in whatever uh, or take off uh, whatever the board members uh, want to see happen the next year. Uh, so we'll have that foundation based on what each of the departments understand at this point and then uh, uh, elaborate on that at the board workshop. Thank you. And if I might just ask a quick follow up, um, do you still, um, CAO, want our rural director priority list like we've done the last few years before this meeting? Uh, sure, that would be great as well. And I'll tell you what we what we like to do is include the uh, uh, inter inter regional or inter electoral area projects on the corporate plan. But even those that are just specific to one area, uh, we'll make sure are on one of the department uh, business plans. Uh, so the way that our system works is that uh, it's a cascading system where uh, we have our corporate documents. Uh, so we'll have our guiding principles with the mission, vision, values, key success drivers and goals. Uh, and then we'll have our annual uh, objectives and performance indicators. So uh, the larger projects, the big picture ones, uh, certainly should be on the corporate plan. Uh, but each of our departments uh, then has a departmental business plan. And it's important that we get uh, the specific projects onto those. So the more we know, the better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments on this topic? Uh, Director Rieger, go ahead, please. Uh, th thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Question uh, with uh, the departure from the regional district. Uh, what uh, planning is in place uh, for? Operation and work on the, on the budget this year. So uh, we're in the process of recruiting right now. The competition's closed. Uh, I'm certainly hoping uh, that by November we would have uh, that position filled. 
but I'm thinking in the meantime, we may uh, go for an interim um, manager of finance. Uh, in, our, in our system, of course, we're sort of, uh, uh, we're very lean in all of our departments, but specifically finance. And the manager of finance is almost solely responsible for budget planning. Uh, we don't have any backup uh, or redundancy uh, for that. So a bad time of year for us to have that position vacant, um, but we'll, uh, I'm going to see if we can get an interim in. Thank you. Director Gettins, you had another question? No, leftover hand. Okay, thank you. Anybody else before we move on to item C? I am not seeing any other hands up. Okay, let's move on to item C, UBCM update, CAO. So everybody should have uh, by now uh, uh, the uh, information on the UBCM program for 2020. I know that the minister meetings are happening this week. Uh, uh, usually they happen right at the conference, um, but uh, I know uh, all of our member municipalities are busy and we had uh, we have three meetings uh, this week ourselves. Uh, but next week uh, uh, there will be the, the SILGA uh, meeting. That's in... Uh, oh, that's the following week. Yeah. Yeah. That's on the so next 20th. week is UBCM uh, virtually, and, and uh, the program came out. And uh, as I understand it, you had to register or you won't get an invitation with the password or whatever, however they're going to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and you had to register, I think, for each of the sessions uh, that you wanted to participate in. No, no, just for the... Just for UBC. It's an overall registration. Um, I'm a bit concerned about they, they're supposed to email a link to each director. Mm -hmm. um, and that may not happen with our email system the way, down the way it is. So we've given them a secondary info at RUS. So if on Monday uh, those directors uh, who have registered don't see a link, um, contact us right away and we'll find a way to get you that link so that you can get in the system. Yeah, or we can set up in here. Yeah. Yeah. And then the town of Oliver is uh, hooking up to UBCM at Venables, uh, and uh, the CAO has invited um, those from around that area if they wanted to attend in person at Venables, uh, they could sit in with the group as well. Well, those from around any area. So we have space for um, probably about 20 people, socially distanced, more than socially distanced. The theater has... Um, capacity for I think over 60 following or sorry over 50 following the distancing protocols but we figured we capped it about 20. Uh, we can put UBCM up on the up on the big screen and we can sit in the theater um, and at least share the experience with um, as many directors as would like to attend. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be super casual like bring your coffee, bring your lunch. <laughs> uh, there's a lunch break so we can go out for lunch. Um, but it, it would just be nice to be able to share in that experience with some directors from around the area as we usually do. So please share with your councils as well. And if anyone's interested in joining, um, sure. contact the CAO or myself and we can get you more information. Great, thank you. And, and uh, just to confirm with Christine, we have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday booked here, correct? We do. So, um, it might be good if, if uh, board members were wanting to come in here, just maybe send Christy a, an email to confirm, just so we make sure that we have adequate space set up for those who want to attend in person here at the RUS. Uh, Director Knodel has a hand up. Go ahead, please. Uh, just to, to Christy, uh, last year we had a book on the resolutions for UBCM. Yeah. Uh, just wondering whether we can get a, 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 a virtual link for that at home, uh, that would be very helpful in, in planning out what, when and where we want to be kind of thing. I think, uh, Director Knodel, if you just go to the UBCM website, they've got the whole agenda on there and links to everything. So you'd be able to pull up the resolutions from their website directly. Have a look through their site. Let us know if there's any questions or concerns, and then we can help you out with that. Anybody else on this topic? Okay, then we've got item D, information services verbal update, CAO? Yeah, I was just gonna get Mr. Francisco to uh, give the board another update 
as to how we're making out with our cyber attack. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Chair. Good morning, board. Um, we're moving ahead every day. Uh, we're doing well. I'll give you a, just a quick update. Uh, what we have planned uh, this weekend, where we'll be activating our email system, uh, cutting that over so that uh, all staff and directors can receive email. Uh, and last night we started uh, bringing back online some of our uh, other office and, and sites uh, other than 101 uh, Martin Street. So we're continuing that process goes tomorrow and over the weekend as well. So hopefully for Monday morning you'll have access to email and most of our sites will have access back to some corporate services. Um, we still have lots to work do after that. Um, the cyber insurance company continues to uh, go through information and uh, they're just in the process of now of, of uh, purposely hacking our system. So um, as part of their process, they come in and, and try to hack the system and, and uh, provide an overview of what they find so that we have a report moving forward as to what to look at in the future and uh, what kind of recommendations they suggest for us. So that's kind of where we're at right now in a, in a nutshell, but uh, every day we provide more services and kind of get back to a new sense of normal. And I know that one of the interests of our member municipalities is mapping uh, in that we provide uh, mapping for a number of the smaller ones and that has been somewhat intermittent um, but I know that uh, the department still working on that. Uh, we are going to have a CAO group meeting next week and uh, Danny is going to give the CAOs an update uh, on more detail on the mapping part of it uh, amongst the other stuff on the agenda uh, but uh, at this point um, mapping is available uh, it's just uh, there are some limitations. Do you want to talk about that, Danny? Yeah, uh, we've had a fun time with mapping this week. We did have mapping up internally for a while, uh, and then we produced a uh, an online map for the public at general and for people to be able to use our online parcel viewer as well with some uh, new updates, um, and we've gotten some good feedback on that. Um, in the sense of mapping this week, unfortunately, we did have our regular mapping server go down, not attributed to the cyber attack, to uh, something else, and we've had our technicians and GIS specialists working with Esri Canada for the last three days now, trying to recover it. Um, as of this morning, um, they are escalating it again to um, the US help desk. I, I guess they're more competent <laughs> in the product <laughs> and um, hoping to get some resolve there. Unfortunately, um, if we don't get that up and running today, we will have to rebuild the entire mapping system internally. Um, and we'll be looking at that this weekend. Ouch, yeah. Okay. Uh, oops. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Yeah, go ahead. And I know that the mapping system is of interest to uh, realtors and uh, lawyers and uh, mm -hmm. other people other, other than just uh, the public and uh, local governments. So, our, uh, our, our, but to that, our public parcel viewer is active. So that's still functional in the outside world. It's just, um, internally with our mapping, of course, we have access to privacy information, owner information, those kind of things. So to our staff and our memory municipalities that we provide mapping services for, that's kind of where we're at a bit of a loss right now. We don't have that information available to our staff, but the public parcel viewer and everything that it has is still available to both staff and, and the public at large. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll take questions. Director Gettins, go ahead, please. Thank you to the chair. I just wanted to thank the staff. I couldn't imagine doing my day to day under all the pressures that everybody's been working, amping up for budget season and not having your email. Um, I've just, I found the staff really receptive to the workarounds and trying hard to get things done. And I just wanted to put that out there because I think it's been a year and um, this is certainly um, an extra addition to this year. So just thanks for everybody's efforts. Great, thank you very much for that, Director Gettins. Director Canola, is that a leftover hand from the previous topic? Yep. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, anybody else with a question or comment regarding information services? Uh, Director Gettins, I think that's a leftover hand too, right? Yes, okay. Uh, if I'm not, not looking, I'm not seeing anybody else. I think we're all good then. Uh, if that's the case, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn corporate services. Moved, seconded, all in favor, opposed, Carry. thank you very much. And folks, we do have time for a very short break before we start the board meeting. So we have about uh, eight minutes or so, and we will start promptly at 1045. Thank you.
everybody went home. Everybody disappeared. <laughs> oh, okay. Good okay. afternoon, directors. We are going to get started with the regular board meeting. I'd like to start by once again wel welcoming alternate director Judy Sentis, who is filling in for Director Vasilaki today. So welcome, Judy. Thank, Thank you for being here. Uh, directors, have a look at your agendas, please. This is your only opportunity to remove an item from the consent agenda. I see Director Gettins has a hand up. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Can I please remove item 2B under development services? Okay. So 2B is coming off of consent, and that is going to go to B4. Is that correct, Ms. Holden? That's right. So B4. Um, yeah, so it'll be B4B. There we go. Thank you. Anybody else have anything they would like to remove from the consent agenda? I'm not seeing any hands up there. I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda. As amended. As amended. Director Bush, thank you. Is there a seconder? Director Gettins, thank you. And I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. Anyone opposed? The motion carries. I'm looking for a motion now to approve the consent agenda corporate issues. Moved by Director Coyne Jr. and seconded by Director Bush. Thank you. I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. Anybody opposed? Motion carries, and I'm looking for a motion to approve consent to agenda development services. That was amended to remove item B. That is moved by Director Gettins. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Director Bush. I'll call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. And anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. We're going to go on to item B. Development Services, Rural Land Use Matters, B1, Zoning Bylaw Amendment, 2390 Colm Colmont Road in Area H, CAO. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So this is a rezoning uh, to permit a two-lot subdivision out in the Tulamine area. And uh, the intent is to have two four-hectare uh, uh, size parcels. And we're recommending that it get first and second reading, Madam Chair, and that the meeting, that the hearing be held before the board on October 25th. Okay, thank you very much. I'll go to Director. Sorry, October 15th. October 15th, okay. Thank you, I'll go to Director Coyne Sr. I'd like to make the administrative recommendation, please. Okay, thank you. Second. Seconded by Director Pendergraft. Are there any questions or comments? This is a rural vote. Okay, not see any questions. I'll call the question then. All in favor? Hands are going up. Thank you. Hands can come down. And was anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries. We'll go on to B2. Zoning bylaw amendment, Loose Bay, Area C, CAO. Uh, so this is now the rezoning for uh, the Loose Bay campground in Area C, Madam Chair. Uh, the board will recall, uh, recall it went through the Agricultural Land Commission. Uh, one of the conditions of the approval uh, of the campground as non-farm use was that it still remain agriculture uh, as far as the zoning goes. So. Uh, and campgrounds are not permitted in the agricultural zone. So we're recommending that uh, we give this uh, first and second reading, Madam Chair, to permit uh, the campground in the uh, agricultural zone, and then it come back before the board for public hearing on October 15th. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Canoble. Move the recommendation. Okay, thank you. Seconded by Director Pendergraft. Any questions or concerns with this one? I'm not seeing any. This is a rural vote again. I'll call the question. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Hands can come down. 
Anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll go to B3, Agricultural Land Commission referral, non-farm use at 1543 Maple Street in Area D, CAO. Yeah, this is in Okanagan Falls, Madam Chair. It's an application uh, to build a sort of a wine uh, storage, equipment storage, uh, supplies type of uh, structure. Um, it doesn't, it, the, the problem is it is not on uh, the actual uh, land that the uh, vineyards are on. Uh, so um, it's two wineries um, that are going to use the same building, but it's off site. So uh, we're recommending, so we'll require a rezoning later on. We're recommending that it not go to the uh, ALC manager. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Director Obrick. Uh, yes, thank you to the chair. And I'd like to make the alternate um, motion to uh, have this proposal considered by the Area D Advisory Planning Commission. Uh, the issues here are, are fascinating. Um, the property does have Owner, previous owner of the property has a winery nearby. There has been a sale of the property. The uh, when you read the report, there's some interesting questions about definitions and, and so on, um, and, and uses. You know, is there a a um, a nexus between the, vine, the the grapes that are being grown and, and the uh, warehousing storage purpose? Uh, if there was a winery on site, then the warehousing would be permitted. So I think it's a really valuable conversation for the community at large to participate in. And, and I think it's uh, an interesting discussion for the board as well as we go forward, because these kind of issues will potentially repeat. Uh, it speaks to the agricultural use of land and what that really means. And, and I think that's a real important throughout the region from um, giving the Advisory Planning Commission an opportunity to, to, to uh, weigh in on this. Thank you very much. Okay, so Director Oberg has made that motion. It looks like Director Monteith is seconding that motion. Are there any questions or comments regarding this? I'm not seeing any. Okay, and this is a corporate vote. I'll call the question then. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. And is anybody opposed? Uh, Director Monteith, you're opposed, or is that a leftover hand? Nope. Okay. I'll ask again. Anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. So that's now going to take us to item 4B that was removed from the consent agenda. That is development variance permit 2620 West Bench Drive in area F, CAO. Uh, this is a variance for a garage shop type of building, Madam Chair, and they're applying to vary the maximum height from 4.5 meters to 5 meters. I uh, understand they want to try and get their motor home into it. And we were uh, recommending that this be approved, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much. I'll go to Director Gettins on this. Uh, thank you, the Chair. I just wanted to confirm with the staff, um, when we recently did the Area F OCP, it was really, really clear that these monster garages that end up being used for industrial uses, home industry, um, were not welcomed in West Bench. So whenever I see a variance like this, it always I just always wanna make double sure. Um, so I did work with staff a little bit, I had a good chat with them. And the only variance is just the height. It is a large structure, but because it's a larger property, it's still within the square footage or the percentage of the property that's allowed to be used. Um, and then the staff did confirm as well that there's no indication on the plans uh, that this will be used for any other reason to destroy the motor home and the boat. Um, and I just wanted to also point out and just have it for the board's knowledge that if the property backs on to undeveloped PIB land. So um, when they sent out the letters, they sent out 25 letters uh, just to let the neighbors know. But the, they actually had to send those letters out twice because of the cyber attack. It was postponed. 
And we haven't heard back from either of those two rounds of letters. And I just wanted to confirm that with staff, that that's still the case, that there's been no indication that anybody has a problem with this, with this larger building, but not a industrial size of garage. Mr. Garish, can you confirm? Or sorry, Joanne, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have received uh, no uh, correspondence um, on this application and no uh, phone call inquiries um, asking questions or providing any verbal comments whatsoever. Okay, just as a follow up. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Director Gittins. Thank you, Chair. As a follow up, it's also the way the property is handled. You can't see this building from the streetscape. So with the background and just again, thank you to the staff for following up and answering my questions. And just for background with the board, I wanted to share why um, I'm moving ahead with the administrative recommendation, please. Okay, so you're moving the admin recommendation. I see Director Roberts is seconding it. Are there any questions or concerns? Not seeing any, and I'll call the question. All in favor? Guns are going up. Those can come down, thank you. And was anybody opposed? Motion carries, thank you very much. So now we're going to move on to finance. C1, utility billing, late payment fee, CAO. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, because of the cyber attack and the effect it had on our uh, servers, we aren't, uh, while we're able to uh, take money, uh, we can't actually update our files. Uh, and at the same time, we can't generate and send out uh, uh, invoices on the Naramata water system. So uh, we're just recommending that we just waive uh, all penalties until the end of the year, uh, Madam Chair, and we think by that time we'll be back uh, in full operation. Thank you. Is there anyone going to move this? Director Tandegraaf has moved it, seconded by Director Coyne Jr. Any questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. It is a weighted corporate vote. Okay, I'll call the question then. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. And was anybody opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to item D, legislative services, D1, open burning regulations by law, CAO. Yeah, we've been working, in our, uh, I'd say Ms. Ms. Malden and the fire chiefs have been working uh, on this one for a while, uh, Madam Chair. So what this then is doing is a proposal that we um, change a bylaw to uh, cover yard waste and agricultural waste uh, as far as open burning goes. And uh, it is just for the Okanagan, uh, the Sunokameen uh, uh, fire departments weren't in favor as I understand it. Uh, so we're recommending that this uh, open burning bylaw uh, get uh, first, second, third and adoption manager. Okay, thank you. Is someone willing to move that? Director Pendergraf, thank you. Is there a seconder for this? Director Oberick, thank you very much. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> Director Bush, go ahead, please. Yeah, I know it's not my area, but I have concerns about um, closing the campfire ban, or putting on a campfire ban by the fire chiefs. And, and I actually thought it would be better if that was a board decision, not just a fire chief decision. Or, or how, I'm not even sure how that's going to work. I think that it shouldn't be just up to one person to decide stuff like that. Um, we've had lots of problems in the past just with um, uh, fire chiefs and, and their members. I just think it's opening up a problem for fire chief and the public. And the other one is uh, that ban for the 11 o'clock campfire permits. But it's mm -hmm. just, I think it's a concern that you should be aware of. We'll turn this to Ms. Mullen, um, I'm sure. So um, I'm not looking, I'm not seeing where in here 
there is a part that allows the fire chief on their own um, to impose a campfire ban specifically. Um, oh, there it is, fire chief may impose a campfire ban in the fire protection area. So the fire chiefs wanted to build that in as a flexibility measure because the provincial um, campfire ban comes out of Kamloops and it's not necessarily reflective of those in the more desert areas. So that was something that the fire chiefs in the li liaison group had discussed quite a bit um, with that authority for them to do that. And the 11 o'clock as well, that was something that the fire chiefs had come up with and they were quite happy to be prepared to enforce that in those areas. I know that was a discussion for the Caribbean area and that's part of the reason you know, Kermias chose to opt out, but I think those fire chiefs wanted that ability to um, ensure that campfires did end at that time of night. Yes, so to the chair, mm -hmm. um, how does that work then? So each fire chief can just say that they phone up the regional district and say, I want a fire ban or on campfires, or is there no discussion? Or, or, I don't know. I mean, it's going to be different in, from one end of the valley to the other. I don't know if this is the proper way to go or not. Not my problem, but. <laughs> go ahead, Ms. Malden. So in discussions with the fire chiefs, that was something that they were going to determine as a group when they met um, and supported by each other through the society. So uh, I don't believe the impression I was given it wasn't an individual um, fire chief just making a, a decision on their own that they would discuss that and resolve that as a group. That's why I thought it should be a board decision coming from the fire chief. Uh, just, did, did this go through the fire chief committee? Through the chair, yes, it, it was discussed, but I don't think they really got into the particulars on how it was going to be dealt with. I think, as uh, Ms. Moulton explained, I think it was going to be as a group they would put a campfire ban on for their whole area sort of deal. But, but the bylaw doesn't require it to be a joint decision. It can be by fire district. I don't think it's specific. No. Right. Okay. Thank you. We have some questions. I've got Director Knodel and Ben Tanilla. Go ahead, Director Knodel. Well. <laughs> yeah, quite likely that uh, I'm going to have to agree with uh, your there may have to be some oversight uh, just to keep an overzealous uh, application of this, this ruling. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'd want to hold up the bylaw or whether we can amend as we go along. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that question to uh, Christy. Well, I'm just wondering too, if the board was oversight and then a recommendation comes from the fire chief and we meet every two weeks, it can be a significant delay if there's a need to implement a ban. Did you want to speak to that, Christy, or should I take more questions right now? Um, I guess you could take more questions. Okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Okay. We'll go to Director Ventimiglia. Thank you. Uh, so I missed that one and read through the bylaw, but it makes total and complete sense what Director Bush is saying. And if the discussion around the table um, had more to do with the fire chiefs making a joint decision. And I think that even if it's an amendment, that should be reflected in the bylaw because if we ourselves reading it don't quite understand what's going on, how is somebody five years down the road to know what's going on? Um, I don't necessarily think that it would the board would need to have oversight just because of that time issue, but it would be super confusing for there to be, you know, a fire of anarchist, but not you know, in Willowbrook or you know, whatever it would be if it's sort of sporadic and divided all over the place. Thank you. Yeah, I would have some concerns about it, the need to come to the board because we've had discussions over the years that the chiefs are the managers of their departments. They are the experts. Problematic to have someone have to come back here. Uh, let's hear from others, though. I've got Director Roberts next. Thank you to the chair. I just wanted to support uh, Director Bush and his statements. And at the same time, I believe that this, again, highlights the incongruency that we have with kind of like the, the chief's organization and the management uh, format that we are now saddled with. So 
um, it, it does seem to pose more questions than answers. Thank you. I'll go to CAO Noel. Uh, the other thing we should throw in the mix then, I guess, is the incorporated communities. So if we're concerned about uh, different rules coming out for different uh, fire departments, then uh, I think we, the board may want to consider uh, the incongruity of, uh, say, a city of Penticton not having a fire uh, ban or a campfire ban, but uh, those surrounding areas having it. Very confusing for the citizens, I suppose. Okay. Thank you. We'll go to Director Monti. To the chair, I really echo what Carla is expressing in that they are managers of their areas and they are the subject matter experts. So I really rely on them to provide us the guidance on that. But I also recognize that they they have a liaison group and they have somebody that is sort of, you know, the staff, Dale. Is it possible to get Dale involved in this conversation and table this till later to bring it back to the, in this meeting to maybe get some of their input? Because I don't see any of them as participants. And I'm concerned that if we're having a conversation in depth of this bylaw, um, I'd rather have full information on it today. But I know time is of the essence. Thank you. Hey, okay, thank you for that. Uh, we've got a few others to hear from and then we'll make a decision here. Director Holmes is next. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I'm not really sure how you ensure harmony across region, but I'm sure the fire chiefs could figure that out. I, I would be uh, reluctant to um, the board uh, decide whether you know a bunch of politicians decide whether there ought to be a, a fire ban or not. I, I don't think that's our role. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Director Oberk is next. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you to the chair. Uh, I just wanted to add to the conversation. Uh, I did speak with our fire chief about this uh, open burning regulation bylaw, and, and I'm quite satisfied it's a step in a positive direction. I do appreciate that the Similkameen, uh, Karameos, and Tulamin uh, fire chiefs uh, and, and their areas have withdrawn from this. It's a different area, and, and I respect that they have different viewpoints. Um, I think public safety is paramount. I think the fire chief in our area, I'll speak to specifically, does a great job, and they need the necessary tools and abilities to exercise their professional training and expertise. This is about public safety. Uh, we just had a wildfire that uh, what was very serious in our area and uh, it didn't impact uh, the other areas the same way. Uh, time is critical when you're dealing with these issues and when uh, a fire department's responding to uh, a danger, uh, a fire, a, a yard fire, a campfire, uh, these are concerns in our community and our community uh, really uh, appreciates uh, making things better and, and taking steps in a, in a forward positive direction. So I also echo uh, the chair of uh, comments and, and I just wanted to add that because uh, it, it's, it's pretty serious for us. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director McCordoff next, please. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, the town of Vesuvius has a fire ban period. No and uh, we do have uh, people because we live on the lake um, that um, that you know are very concerned about that and would like to have, uh, you know a hot dog roast down on the beach of their property. Unfortunately, that's been our that's been our bylaw, and we do not allow fires in the town for two reasons. One is safety of our residents, and the other is the air quality, which um, seems to be, as we know, we're dealing with it right now, um, very difficult to deal with. So our concern is um, that the edge of town, Area A, if there is fires allowed there and not in the town, it, it just doesn't make sense. So we are certainly um, willing to look at having a, um, a, a, a fire ban, um, as was stated in here, for those reasons, air quality and public safety. Thank you. 
Hey, thank you. Director Knodel, you're next. I, uh, the more that I'm listening, the more I'm becoming convinced that Director Bush is absolutely right, but quite possibly the oversight could be post the uh, ban being thrown as, a, as opposed to uh, having to come to the board to approve the ban. Uh, I, I'm not in a position where even with the lung condition that I would want to see a draconian measure where we just ban all campfires altogether. There is a, a, a state of, of enjoyment of, of life and uh, we can carry this on to a point of uh, absurdity in, in a rural area. So possibly we should look at a post direction as opposed to uh, uh, trying to control what the, the fire chief has to do at the moment. We can always look at whether his opinion was correct by a, a post complaint system and, and that might fit the situation better. Fire chiefs are faced with making a decision at the time, but they're also an opinion decision. Uh, possibly it'd be to uh, better to be evaluated by the fire chiefs in the surrounding area. Also, politicians change and fire chiefs will change and therefore the opinions will change uh, from time to time. And a little bit of oversight here might go a long ways and, and calm some potentially badly troubled waters if, if this gets carried away. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm just wondering if some of the hands I'm seeing are left over. Uh, Director Overick, is yours left over? Yeah, okay, Director Holmes. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions, comments, suggestions? I see Director Monteith, go ahead, please. Are we able to make a motion to postpone this or bring this back later in this meeting and get Dale or Dennis involved in this conversation before we make a decision? could propose a motion to defer mm -hmm. for so that we could have some further research done. But I'd like it done at this meeting. Could it come back later today? No. No. We got the hospital board. No, we've got hospital yeah. board coming up next. So we, we can have a motion to defer and hopefully bring back at the next meeting, which is October 1st, I mm -hmm. believe. So not too far off. And who we're, we're deferring it for what matter, Chair? For, uh, for further uh, discussion, is it, Director Monteith? Are with, we sending it back to the committee? Or? Is that to the committee or is that uh, Ms. Malden receiving some follow up information through Mr. Cronenbush, I believe you recommended? Yes, if we have concerns about the bylaw, they should be on this call to be able to support where they're going with this as well as the liaison group so if they're not on the call and i don't know if they were invited to attend the meeting um or they knew about it i don't know but if we're looking at not approving it i feel like we should have their input before we get there or maybe we could ask Ms. Baldwin if she has a suggestion on process sure um i think that what we should do is um a member can make a, a motion to defer until the next meeting, and at that point, we'll encourage um, Fire Chief Godfrey and, and Dale Cronenbush to attend the meeting, and we'll bring the whole bylaw back to committee. Right, okay, thank you. Um, I do have a few more people who want to speak. Director Bush? Yeah, so I think uh, CAO Newell brought up a, <laughs> a good thing here. Like, I think that the municipalities and the regional district fire departments should all be on the same page and and get this bylaw doesn't really state that and and i think that's important that the whole regional district or at least the valley wide should be on the same page as like summerland and pendleton and suyas oliver etc thank you and i'll go to director coin jr Uh, I was just wondering if there's a financial implication to having the fire chiefs, you know, making this decision and then sending out the fire department to enforce it and everything else. There's got to be financial costs here as well. I'll go to Ms. Malden on that. 
So any cause for enforcement um, in this bylaw refers over to our um, bylaw notice enforcement bylaw, which gives the authority um, for either an enforcement officer or the fire chief to enforce fines. And that's how costs would be recovered. So where does that come out of, Christy? The bylaw notice enforcement bylaw? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's where that bylaw gives the authority for them to, to um, levy those fines. And where do the administrative costs of, uh, come from? They would come from the fine as well. Everything would come from the fine that's imposed. So the bylaw notice will come forward to meeting following this, this and um, those fines would be adjusted accordingly because there has to be an allowance in there for an administration cost. Yeah, well, I think in most cases, they just go out and say, put out that campfire. That's that's the um, most beneficial way. So there'd However, be a cost of the fire department. Yeah, so bonding. That's just part like of the it service. is now. Just like it yeah. is now. However they recover it now, that would not change at all. So anytime they go out and, and tell people to put out fires or to do any sort of education or whatever, that's absorbed in their existing budget, and that wouldn't change that part of it. But if there's a need to, the second step um, to impose a fine, that would the authority would come through a bylaw notice. Yeah. So ex exactly as we are right now, they're being dispatched for burning complaints. Yeah. The it's the same department. thing, and, and it's coming out of their department costs. Okay, we've got a couple more uh, questions here, Director Ventimiglia. Sure. Thank you. I was just going to add that I think if we are, um, I mean, I support the idea of deferring to a further meeting for a little bit more information. Uh, but I think we are inviting um, those that were involved in the creation of um, this document that that we specifically were looking for information around that one item that Director Bush pointed out right at the beginning. That's what we're looking for further clarification. Um, and just to restate, I think that it would be just totally confusing for people if um, you just up and down the road you have different rules. It does make sense. Like Oliver is quite similar to Zeus in the fact that we don't allow open burning or campfires. Um, I think it's on properties less than two acres, but I might not be totally correct. It makes sense that there's different rules in the city and, and in the rural area, uh, but it doesn't really make any sense that there would be different rules up and down the south of the I'm not sure on this, but would it be possible that uh, the, the bigger fire chiefs group could get together and sort of have uh, an inclusive rule about campfires? Hear from Ms. Malden on that. So just to shed a bit of light on that, I did attend a meeting out in Eris um, some time ago where all of the fire departments were present, or, or at least a representative from the majority of them, including the municipal ones, and that was not something that they felt would be at that point, and again, you know, there's for the discussion, that there could be a customized approach to a municipal and electoral area. Right now, there's probably five different methods and different um ways of managing these things through the municipalities and through the electoral areas and through the fire protection areas there's two of those so right at the moment it's very non-standardized um our efforts were to of course make it as standardized as possible and that's where we are today thank you i'll go to director pendergraf yeah i'm getting a little bit concerned with uh the rural areas not having campfires that doesn't make any sense <laughs> If you want them to be the same as the municipalities, absolutely not. <laughs> we have to be allowed to have campfires in the rural area. Secondly, I think we're also getting a little bit overboard on, on the wording of the fire chief may impose a campfire ban in a fire protection area. That would only be under extremely uh, dry conditions it isn't something they're just going to do willy-nilly I, I think we're kind of getting a little bit overzealous here or we're worried over nothing that would only happen we give staff all kinds of opportunity that they only do things when there's an absolute need to this is no different this is rdos staff that we're dealing with mm -hmm. why are we making a big deal out of this let them do their jobs Thank you, Director Pendergraf. I see Director Holmes has his hand up. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. I was going to say something uh, similar, maybe a little more diplomatic, though, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think we can get carried away with uh, standardization. I, I uh, you know, um, we're different communities, and in, in different communities, we have different uh, ways of doing things, and that's not that's not a bad thing. You know, in Summerland, we like our campfires here, and if uh, we try to say, well, the region the region wants to um, get rid of campfires in all municipalities, uh, well, you get some pretty uh, big resistance from Summerland. I can tell you that. So, um, you know, it, it's okay that we're we're different. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Robinson, go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, I, I seriously think we need to send this back to the fire chiefs again. I know they've already discussed it, but there's a couple of things that I think we might be missing. Number one is that air quality does not respect any boundaries, whether they're municipal or rural. Uh, we all breathe the same air. Uh, number two, uh, in the past, it was easy enough to say under extremely dry conditions. But all we have to do is look south of the border to see what's going on in Washington, Oregon, California, with all the climate change that's coming. Um, I think it, it possibly could be quite naive of us to think that, you know, for entertainment, having open fires, wherever you feel like it, I think those days may be coming to an end. I'm one of the first people who love to sit outside with a fire, but I think we have to be reasonable in light of climate change and everything else going on. So I would prefer to leave it up to the experts and refer it back to uh, the group of all the fire chiefs and see what they can come up with. And if they suggest we keep doing it individually, then so be it. But Otherwise, I think we could go around and around in circles all day long on this subject. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple more people who want to speak, and I understand that we have Mr. Cronenbush on the line as well. Um, I'm not so sure about referring it back out because they just completed this process, and this is what they presented to us. Uh, but before we get to Mr. Cronenbush, we'll just hear uh, quickly from Director Obrick next, followed by Director Pendergraft. Go ahead, Director Obrick. Uh, yes, thank you to the chair. Uh, I, I just wanted to thank uh, Director Pendergraft. I, I agree with, with his remarks uh, completely, and, and I wanted to add, uh, I have complete confidence and faith in our Area D fire chief, fire department, they do excellent work. And uh, I, I do not uh, think that we are going to suffer uh, any bad consequences uh, by supporting uh, this bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Director Pendergraph? I just wanted to make the point that campfires will be banned by the province if there's a need, if the conditions are dry enough. If they're not for the province to do it, that's when the chief would have the ability to say, geez, we're really dry here. We better put a campfire ban on in this specific area. That's the way it is set up to work. It's not that there's campfires all year round now. It's the same as it is today, except for the fire chief having the ability to ban them in his area specifically if it was extenuating circumstances. Thank you, I have to say I agree with that. And I've heard from citizens in Area E that they're wanting uh, more campfire bans to happen and they question why they're not. And I'll, and I'll say it again, we, we talked over the past few years about not micromanaging the fire chiefs, they are managers of their departments and that we need to let them do their jobs and defer to them as the experts. So. Um, I, I'm fine with this uh, bylaw that they have presented to us. Uh, we do have more people with questions, but I'm wondering if we could hear from Mr. Cronenbush now, and then we'll go to more questions. If uh, Dale would like to chime in here, that would be appreciated. You're just on mute so far, Dale.
Danny, do you have to take him off of you? I can. Okay, Danny's going to take Dale off of you. There we go. Go ahead, Dale. Oh, hi. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I like the I like the dialogue that's going along. At least we're having that discussion. The fire chiefs have um, have got that clause in there only so that they're able to control. Uh, lots of times when the province puts in a ban for fires, um, usually either, even up into industrial two fires, we don't necessarily we respect what they do for that, as we do respect the um, the right to farm act and so on. And the part of their process is, is to burn stuff, especially during times of blight and that sort of thing. We try to work with the um, agricultural folks to make sure that that's all happening. We're all aware of that. Where the real issue is is when you start getting into some real strong winds, and specifically when there was no campfire ban on when Christie Mountain Fire was happening. And we all know and we've just, just gone through that, and that was one of the times that we should have said, yes, there should be a ban. Now, to uniformly uh, have all the fire departments uh, to put a ban on campfires, we've normally done that when we've when we've seen the significant um uh causes that it can happen further down like further south because it's usually drier in the south than it is up in the north so but even even uh summerland has put on uh campfire brands or at least gotten on together so we're all sort of uniformed um so it it works it works really well to do that uh, in comparison to a Soyuz, uh, where a Soyuz has a, has a campfire ban all the time, so you can't have a fire there. And I think Oliver is also that way as well, except Oliver has a protection area that, that has no control in the rural areas of Area C, under their, and they're under a, definite, a, a protection society. So they've got the problem as well, but if collectively we can come up with some sort of legislation that's going to allow the fire chief to be able to put the ban on, or at least put the call out to it, now, even during the Christie Mountain Fire, there was a call made out to the province to ask for them to stop the uh, industrial two fires and so on, and campfire bans, and it just it didn't happen, whether they're just too busy or whether they felt that it wasn't necessary. I mean, it's the same thing as, as when we talk about the smoke and, and people are choking, choking down here and the visibility and all these other things, and it just stops, stops industry. It stops a lot of things that are happening. And to me... Um, I think it's a good call to allow the fire chiefs to be able to put on those temporary bans to try and um, and trying to control and make sure the communities are safer and we're not getting that fire spread going through. Great. Thank you very much, Dale. If you can just hang on. Uh, we sure. We might have a few more questions here. Uh, Director okay. Ventimilla, did you have another one? Thanks. Yeah. So I understand um, where Director Pendergraft is coming from and I appreciate hearing from Dale. I guess my question, I'm, I'm worried about confusion. And so then my question is, how will area-specific bans be communicated to the public and to those areas to avoid confusion? So I think I'd go to Ms. Malden, mm -hmm. uh, since she handles communications. So we did speak with the Fire Chiefs group about that um, several times, about the way that they currently communicate and how we can improve that. And, you know, some of them have put money away in the budget to allow for us to be able to build those programs and that would be something that would come to us uh, and we would release through our usual um, processes which is generally our Facebook site and um, an info release specific specifically in that area and also using civic ready as well go ahead director so Bennett. if I may follow up and make a suggestion not that our regular channels are not good but just with the Facebook algorithms and things like that not everybody sees all of these messages that we put out so thinking further down the road, I think that perhaps it's like a boots on the ground thing might be the best approach when we're talking smaller areas and those billboards that we use, um, or maybe sandwich we use those boards. in all of our sandwich boards that we use to let people know, like, you know, mm -hmm. at the entrance to the back country roads that they might go in camping on, fire, local fire ram in effect. Mm -hmm. But those are what are right in people's faces as they're heading out for the weekend and they maybe didn't get, it didn't come up in their Facebook mm -hmm. feed or didn't check their email before they left. Yeah, that's a great idea. We do them with Bear in the area or yeah. Cougar in the area, those types of things. So um, that's a great idea. So uh, let's just wrap this up. I think we have a couple more questions. Director Robinson, did you have another comment? Yeah, I just wanted to apologize being new to the board. I didn't realize that the fire chiefs had just gotten together. So I'm good with whatever they have to tell us. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much. And Director Monteith, go ahead, please. To the chair, after hearing uh, Dale's conversation being added to this conversation, um, and knowing that our fire chiefs are managers of the area, that they do have a very effective committee of working together and through the liaison group, I would like to make the administrative recommendation, please. Okay, I think we already have the motion on the floor. Okay. So that was moved and seconded. So before I call the question, I'd like to just ask if there's any other comments or questions. Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any unless uh, Director Monteith is at a leftover hand. Thank you. Okay, folks, we Hello, do. Oh, sorry, Director Coyne Sr., go ahead, please. Is, is this a participant vote or a, a general majority? This is a corporate vote. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any further questions or comments. It's a corporate vote. I'll call the question then. All in favor? Thank you. Hands can come down. And I'm going to call for those opposed. I've got uh, Director Coyne Sr. And that's the only opposed. Please speak up if there's anyone else opposed that I've missed. Okay, not seeing any motion carries. And thank you, uh, Dale Cronenbush, for joining us to help out with that discussion this afternoon or this morning. I'm still in the morning. Yeah. Okay, we are going to move on to item E. That's a CIO verbal update. Uh, nothing for me, Madam Chair. Okay, then we'll go to AF Chair's report. So I've got a couple of things just to update on. Uh, as everyone knows, we're doing our minister meetings. Uh, Monday, we had our teleconference with Minister Heyman and uh, yesterday with Minister Popham. Those went really well. Director Knodel's been taking the lead on those topics. Uh, those are the ones he submitted. So I'm going to leave that for Director Knodel to update us just a little bit later under uh, Director's Updates. And uh, of course, tomorrow we have another one with Flynn Rowe. So that's on. Uh, uh, works in creeks and waterways and permitting issues. Uh, so next week, we all know is UBCM. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are full days. And uh, please just advise, let Christine know if you want to come in here and use space. And uh, Director Ventimilla, let us know that they are hosting at Venables. Uh, when Director Ventimilla was out of the room, I think George was asking if muffins would be available. <laughs> so you have to direct those questions to Petra to find out what they're offering to entice you there. Um, and then we also have on Monday, or, or I do, I should say, the AGM for MFA and, and MIA, so I'll be participating in those. And I'd like to remind everybody about the SILGA AGM, that's Tuesday the 29th, it's about an hour long. Uh, please participate in that AGM. We have a few minor things to deal with. We vote through our financials, but we do have an election for director at large that we will be um, looking after. And we have nine folks running for seven positions. So we have a couple from the RDOS. Director Judy Sentis is running again. So thank you for letting your name stand again, Judy. And for the first time, we have Director Spencer Coyne Jr with his name uh, in the booklet. So we'd like to support our colleagues and see if they get elected to directors at large. And a couple more things, September 30th, we have our composting town hall session. So that's uh, evening of the 30th. And uh, both Eric and Andrew worked really hard on the information that will be presented there. So we're looking forward to that education component and receiving feedback from the citizens so we can move forward with our application to the ALC. And on a final note, uh, we'd like to say thank you very much to finance manager John Kerving for his efforts over the past few years. He's in the boardroom here. Uh, we're sad to see him leave. Tomorrow is his last day, but we wish him all the best and uh, hope to see him again in the future. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, it's been a pleasure to serve. Wonderful. 
Okay, that's everything for me. We're going to move on, folks, to board representations. Going to to a uh, Director Bush. Anything with Starling Control? No. Okay. Two uh, B and C is MFA and MIA. So of course that's on Monday. The AGM. Two D is Okanagan Basin Water Board. Director McCordoff. Anything from you? Uh, you're on mute. I'm not hearing you, Sue. You're still on mute. Let me take her off then. <laughs> She's struggling. Danny's <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, it keeps flipping. Okay, now you're good. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry about that. I clicked the wrong thing and my screen went blank. So um, I just wanted to. <laughs> At a little update on Okanagan Basin Water Board. Um, we did have sort of an annual an annual meeting where the annual report was um, was presented. The theme is water connects us all through the valley. And in um, I will not be at the le at the next um, RDOS meeting. My alternate uh, Councillor Rhodes will be attending as well because I will be at the 50th birthday party of um, OBWB and we're holding it at a park in uh, Kelowna. So I will not be there for that one. There are three main programs that the OBWB looks after and those are explained in the annual report, which is online. That would be water management, milfoil control and sewerage facilities grants. And at our last meeting, there were two things that were uh, uh, that we're going to start working on um, quite quickly. One of them is hydrometric monitoring. So, in other words, taking samples of water at various places. There used to be 120 stations available all, along the uh, in the Okanagan. We're down to. 25 or 28 or something like that now. So we're looking at um, and putting more of those in. Of course, there's a huge cost to this, but we want provincial and federal governments to be involved as well. And the other thing is that um, we've been asked by Peachland and it's been mentioned by a few other areas to uh, see if we can do a study on lake levels management. Um, we have had too many, um, you know, floods and droughts. And um, so we need to kind of have a look at this again and see if there's anything that we can do. And um, definitely that will be something that um, we will be looking at. The next meeting that we have at OBWB, we are having Sean Reimer to give his out input on this. So um, please have a look at the, at the annual report and it's on OBWB online. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Director McCordoff. Uh, Director Gettins, anything with Okanagan Film Commission? Yeah, thank you to the chair. We were going to be meeting tonight, but we postponed it till next week. Um, John Summerland is just incredibly busy. It's actually been the busiest year for the film festival, um, which is pretty amazing given it's a COVID year. So they're looking at $35 million in impact. Uh, right now, I think there's filming pretty much throughout the whole valley from Peachland, Kona, Burning next month, of course, in Penticton. I know there's scouts heading out to the Similkami, so it just seems like the Okanagan has really kind of kind of grown up into this next phase now with the Film Commission. Um, so I think there's some really good work going on. And I asked John Curving just to remind me how much per house this was. And I think on average it's 78 cents per household. So I think we're getting some pretty good value supporting this Film Commission. And I think we need to um, a, a look at supporting this further. I think it's bringing a lot of good work to our area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Okanagan Regional Library Board, that's me. We met yesterday, had a meeting. We have our draft budget uh, in place, which will be coming forward in November for adoption. Uh, and I'm going to try and move fairly quickly through the rest as we do have our delegation here for the hospital board meeting, which is next. Director Bush, anything with SIR? Well, we have a meeting coming up uh, Friday, October 2nd. Okay, thank you. Director Pendergraf, we just yeah. heard about Fire Chiefs Association. Great. Uh, Director McCordoff, anything with the Rural Health Care Community Coalition? Say Nothing. No. Okay, and Director Knoll, anything with Simia? Nothing to report on Simia. 
Okay, thank you. So we'll go to item F3, director's motions. We do have a direct, uh, motion from Director Oberick. I'll go to Director Oberick on this. Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, I would uh, like to make a couple comments and, and then make uh, the motion that's uh, been prepared and, and provided. Um, specifically, in, in Area D, there's a lot of interest in agricultural land reserves, in food security and food to table and in growing locally and what we can do uh, to, to preserve agricultural land reserves, ideas of maybe having, uh, if we're gonna take an acre out of a land reserve, maybe replace it with two acres, maybe have some way of uh, finding uh, and, and giving some thought to this. So I wanted to make an invitation to all the other directors. Uh, I've had conversations with Director Canodal and, and others who uh, I've heard at the board table, like Director Bush who, and, and Director Roberts all, and, and Coins, uh, all know more than I do on this. And so I would ask um, for, for some help uh, because it's, a, it's a, an issue of ongoing concern and I, I'm hopeful that the motion will uh, bear fruit in that it will bring back to the board some some creative uh, and, and good ideas that we can all then discuss and, and take forward perhaps to some other action. Uh, thank you. And so I'd like to make the, uh, the motion presented. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there a seconder? Director Canodal, thank you very much. Any other comments or questions on this motion? Uh, Director Coyne Sr., go ahead, please. Could you read the motion, please? Yes, the motion is that staff investigate the impacts of increasing agricultural reserves and agricultural operations to increase food security. Any other questions or comments? Well, Director Bush, go ahead, please. Um, well, as a board, we're going to be looking at taking some land out of the ALR, and I, I'm just wondering if that's a conflict. I, I see it as a request to staff to investigate and come back with some information to the board and recommendations. So. I don't see it as conflict. We're just asking for more information and recommendations. Did anyone else have a, a comment or a question? Director Coyne Sr., go ahead, please. Uh, you're on mute still. <laughs> there you are. Go ahead. I, I think that this is something that we definitely need to talk about at our strategic planning as this is becoming more and more of an issue all throughout the valley. Um, even the, the proofing of the ground proofing of what is there and what is perceived to be agricultural land. So I think this is a really big topic that we really need to delve into. Thank you. I see Director Canodal. Go ahead, please. Uh, Bob, uh, thank you. Uh, I, Director Coins hit the nail right on the head. There's a lot of lands out there that are being farmed that are not in the agricultural reserve. So there's actually a kind of a false sense of, of what kind of grounds that we have under ALC protection. Uh, so yeah, it's a discussion that really needs to happen. Uh, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing it brought forward. Thank you. Thank you. Director Roberts, go ahead, please. Thank you. I'd like to back up uh, both uh, Director Coyne and Director Canodal. Um, and also, I think this also is timely in regards to the discussions that we had yesterday with the Minister of Agriculture in regards to looking at different ways that we can work more effectively going into the 21st century with the ALC. So I think it's this is a very timely uh, motion. Okay, thank you. Any other comments before I call the question? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you, hands can come down. 
Anybody opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Last item is board members verbal update. And I would like to remind everyone we do have the hospital board meeting uh, to start immediately. We do have the delegation here. So uh, if anybody had anything urgent that they'd like to bring forward, or if I can ask if you have something you wanna share that you could do via email, that would be wonderful. Uh, I did ask for Director Knodal to give a really quick uh, blip about the minister meetings that he presented to. So if uh, you could take a couple minutes, Director Knodal, that would be appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, we covered two of the uh, of, of the points brought forward. One with the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change on the absolute necessity for uh, forest fuel reduction uh, program in French and air curtain to reduce smoke. Uh, there was a motion at the uh, uh, UBCM last year to remove the venting index requirements altogether for the, for these burns, uh, and that. Uh, to me is is unacceptable as someone that has a, a, a lung condition. Uh, there is the option of uh, removing the venting in requirements uh, only if, with the use of the equipment, the technology available to reduce the smoke to a, a, a much more uh, conducive uh, atmosphere. Uh, and these burns, forest fuel reduction and agricultural burns are absolute necessities. You know that doesn't play through so much with the the urban uh, people, but they are and must be done. Uh, on the point with the LC uh, 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 meeting with uh, Lana Popham, the agriculture portion of that was brought forward. It was much better re uh, received. I, I don't believe that the uh, Ministry of Environment actually understands that the uh, agricultural burns are allowed by the. Uh, by the act by the Great farm act um, in regard to the other portion of the alc presentation was our value value app options having for farming and uh and it's director getton's uh, predecessor said uh, and bob coin uh, reminded me of of uh, one of the directors um uh, the previous director um uh, and I, his name is alluding me here one said you can judge the success of a ranching operation by the number of logging trucks parked in the yard. That's that's how ranchers have survived for, for the last few years. We need to make these options available for our small farms so they're going to disappear. They will be sucked up by uh, corporate farming. So that was basically the, the gist of uh, my presentation to, uh, to Minister Popham was to look at op uh, options that uh, as a test program pilot area to allow uh, farm use on farmlands that would not impact in any way the farmland that was already dedicated to that farm. There was a whole list there and I will make it available to the board or I have it available to the board through the chair. So with that, I will uh, have one other point. Uh, I feel at a bit of a disadvantage with the uh, in-person meetings. I will make a decision uh, on the day of the, those meetings or before those meetings about attending them in person. Uh, but I, I, everyone should understand, and I believe uh, uh, Director would be able to uh, testify to the, the absolute horror and feeling is of not being able to catch your breath. That's something I've lived with for a number of years now. And uh, that's one of the side effects for a great many people who get afflicted with this disease. Uh, so it's, it tends to be uh, underappreciated uh, and people are starting to recognize that they have long-term lung disabilities afterwards. So for all of you going forward, please be very cognizant about how serious this can be if you are affected. Uh, definitely no uh, uh, explaining it and, and explaining the horror that you fix when you lay in bed at night and try to breathe through a soda straw. And anyway, thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Director Knodel. Uh, so just before we turn things over to Chair Ventimilla, did anybody else have um, something brief they needed to bring forward right now from their area? Uh, if not, and you can put something into an email, that's also wonderful. So I'm just looking to see if there's any hands up. 
If not, I am looking for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Director Bush, seconded by Director Coyne Sr. All in favor? Thank you. As can come down, anybody opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, directors. I will now turn the floor over to Chair Ventimilla for the hospital board meeting. Okay, quick switch. <laughs> um, I would then like to call to order the meeting of the regional hospital district for September 17th and look for an, a motion to approve the agenda. Moved and seconded. And every, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Um, and then we will look for a motion to approve the minutes from our previous meeting of July 16th. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Opposed? And that's been carried as well. So thank you to our presenters that have been hanging on the line and waiting for us to wrap up our last meeting. Um, we've got a few delegations with us today. So we are joined first by Carl Meadows. I don't know, I, there's lots of boxes on the screen. Oh, there you are, <laughs> there you are. Uh, Carl Meadows um, and Dan Goffner from Interior Health. Uh, they're supported by Dr. Tim Phillips um, on the screen and Tracy St. Clair, who's in the room with us um, from the divisions. Uh, and I will turn things over to the CAO to introduce the topic. Oh, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So since 2019, uh, the regional district has had on their uh, business plan uh, a concern about the gap uh, between the number of physicians and uh, the number of patients. And uh, we considered it a quality of life issue at that point for our residents, and that's why we were interested. Uh, so with the assistance of the Division of Family Practice over the last two years, uh, we've been investigating whether the regional district or the hospital district had a role in uh, working on this project. So uh, after much uh, deliberation, uh, it's uh, still uh, to the point where we're trying to decide. Uh, so the request at the last hospital board meeting was that we invite IHA uh, and the division back to discuss uh, what a process might be if the regional hospital district wanted to fund uh, either physician recruitment or the primary care network or, or uh, some other grant program that may be able to assist with the attraction of physicians into the regional district, uh, how that might be prioritized, uh, just a number of questions. So. Uh, with that, uh, Madam Chair, IHA and the division uh, agreed to come today. So, uh, really, I think we turn it over to them, see if they have uh, initial remarks, and then go to questions. Perfect. So, as the CAO just said, after much deliberation, we're still deliberating. <laughs> um, and so, we'll start with Carl and Dan. Um, if you can help us out uh, with, I mean, specifically the motion that was moved last meeting. Um, was uh, for us to get an idea of how the Interior Health Authority participates in physician recruitment, but further to that as well, um, just with the hospital act that we uh, work with and are under, what um, having a facility, a primary care facility designated a hospital facility actually looks like, what that means. So turning it over. Okay. Uh, sure. I'd like to also introduce uh, my colleague, uh, um, Joanna Harrison. She's in one of the boxes. I feel like Hollywood Squares. Uh, and so she is the executive director of Seniors Transformation. So the team is actually Joanna, Dan and myself. So um, thank you, Petra. And just know that the concept of primary care and primary care networks is very, very complicated. Uh, I wish I had a one-liner for you. So for primary care, uh, really it's around uh, making sure clients are attached to primary care physicians or nurse practitioners and uh, with various initiatives, um, as you may or may not know, uh, for Interior Health was the wave one and uh, Tracy uh, is with the divisions as is Tim. They work side by side, but we are completely different entities. So we have a high level of collaboration, but the wave one work was around um, uh, setting up a primary care clinic 
Uh, and Tracy was very, very involved with that, with interior health and making sure that it was a, a team-based care approach with physicians and nurse practitioners and IH staff. And so that is um, that was part of way one. And uh, and even I think, uh, Tracy, I don't know where your face is, uh, but uh, early, early, be even before wave one, uh, Martin Street was one of our uh, initial pieces of, of visioning around primary care uh, for that uh, marginalized uh, uh, population. So. Um, so really, there are some primary care models out there now, and then we've also heard uh, talk about urgent primary and care clinics, and then um, we've got uh, primary care growth plans for rural and remote. So again, it's a very complicated issue, but specifically this topic uh, is really, if you remember the last time we came, uh, Tim and Tracy presented on uh, the vision around uh, co-locating GPs in the South Okanagan, be it Oliver and Asuyas. And so some people got confused. They're like, okay, well, where's IH in this? So I, I wanna just explain that, in, and do, Tony, you'll know this well because you were part of wave one with PCN. Interior health doesn't really, um, we, we don't put capital projects uh, generally with uh, physician models of practice because ph physicians are independent um, uh, business people. But there are these initiatives, as in Ponderosa, where we are working more closely together. So I believe the, the, the thing that we're discussing around the proposals to the RDOS and the health branch is around uh, the opportunity for the divisions to actually co-locate physicians. And, um, and then uh, because of the recruitment challenges, but then our services actually align wherever those primary care interfaces are. So uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, uh, in health authority, create a uh, you know a bricks and mortar build for physician offices. That's not in our scope. Um, but if the province, uh, usually the leasing dollars come from the province to say, if you do this initiative, you get this much for leasing, and this is the model that it needs to look like. So this proposal we support because there would be no way for IH to actually create and have funding for the capital pieces of this. And yet it's going to benefit the South Okanagan by co-locating GPs and having better access. And then our IH services would, uh, with allied health or nursing or home care or whatever it is, uh, would actually wrap around that. Dan, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, the the capital funding that we have is, is really related to any, um, and particularly with primary care, uh, the primary care networks and urgent primary care, which is, was, is linked in with this as well is, is is we get involved from a capital perspective when it's IH services that, that are in that um, bricks and mortar space. Um, so if, if we're not necessarily linked in there directly like we would be for an urgent primary care center and some of the PCN uh, work and partnerships that we have set up, it's not really within our scope to, to get uh, involved uh, in that way. I mean, speaking to your question of, around sort of the, the designation uh, piece of this within the legislation for the regional hospital districts, um, you know, we, we've, in recent years, we've um, been able to, to get a bit more creative in working within the, the bounds of that legislation. So, um, for example, uh, urgent and primary care that was opened in Kelowna um is not it, it was a lease space with it it was former bank of montreal building at one of the shopping centers in Kelowna. um we were able to work with the ministry and get, get it designated as a health care facility and in that way we were on side with with the uh, hospital act and um and the central Okanagan regional hospital district was able to uh, provide capital funding support for that um, facility so there is a process to request that sort of designation for a space um, and it starts with the regional hospital district um, uh, submitting the request to interior health saying um, we would like to uh, request that this space be designated as a healthcare facility uh, IH in turn then goes to the ministry and, and makes that formal request uh, in conjunction with with the RHD or based upon the RHD's request of us. So um, when it comes to non-interior health spaces, uh, I can't say we've done that before. Um, 
So um, if we weren't the leaseholder and old or the owner of of a, that space, um, we we wouldn't be going to the ministry in that case. Um, saying that, I'm I'm not sure uh, whether that question has been asked before, and so that might be something we can take away and and have conversation on uh, with with our ministry contacts uh, on the designation process to sort of see what else has happened out there in in that regard. So. Um, yeah, that was a lot. So I'm sure there's questions. <laughs> so um, thanks for that, Carl and Dan. Just to clarify on that last point, the urgent and primary care center that you're talking about in West Kelowna, um, yeah, that is much different than the primary care clinics that are being considered for the South of Nogan and Snoqualmie, is it not? Like it's a, it's a totally different thing. Um, the, the West Kelowna example is is different. I mean, it, it actually that particular um, um, urgent primary care center is linked with the um, West Kelowna and Peachland primary care network. So the Central Okanagan is also in the process of implementing a primary care network, much like um, the South Okanagan Civil Commune has has started first out of the gate, essentially. Um, so in that case, it actually is a bit of a hybrid um, that is happening there, which is sort of a first of its kind, uh, certainly in IH and maybe even in BC. Um, so um, that's different than the Kelowna one slightly, which is probably different than the Kamloops one. So each of the different um, urgent primary care centers have been a little bit tailored to the needs of the population in that in that area. So. Um, but I think on, uh, in principle, the um, urgent primary care center concept is quite a bit different than the PCN. And Carl, I'm sure you can speak more to that too. Yeah, I know that Tim and Tracy, are there anything to add? Because we work so closely with our divisions uh, here. Anything to add, Tim or Tracy? Can you hear me, Carl? Sorry, I had to switch over to my phone because my laptop died. Um, oh. Yeah, you know, one of the key differences between the UPCs and a lot of the other um, primary clinics is UPCs really are facilities um, um, through and through. Um, so the physicians who work there sign contracts with Interior Health. Um, the difference, like Carl had mentioned, is in the clinics like Ponderosa, um, the physicians are still independent uh, contractors with the Ministry of Health and Health. So it's, uh, it's still a private business. Hey, Tim. Tim, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Just before you go too much further, uh, we're just having a little bit of difficulty hearing you clearly. Would you be able to, I don't know if the phone's too close or too far. Okay. Is that any better? Yeah, that's way better. Okay. Yeah, I'm probably just uh, blocking my mic. Um, so, that yeah, so a, a clinic like Ponderosa is much more of a, uh, uh, the physicians are much more of a private enterprise, and we've just joined forces to try and co-locate with some of the allied health services to work in a team. Um, we know based on some of the discussions we've had with younger docs that what they want to do is work in that in that method. They want to work in as part of a broader team with a group of uh, providers uh, along with a group of support teams. So we're really kind of looking more towards that type of model. And it's almost like a, a public private partnership when you get into those types of clinics where the private portion is the physician portion. The, the other difference I, I would just highlight is the UPCCs that um, Carl and Dan are talking about. Those are health authority owned and operated and leased, as you said, Dan. So that's where it's pretty straightforward. But those opportunities are limited. Um, so those um, Ministry of Health essentially says there's going to be this many UPCCs. So I don't think, just to make it clear, though that's not available for every community. Is that how you say it, Carl? Yeah, but can, but just building on that, Tracy, they are the projects that come with capital improvements, tenant improvements, and there's no, uh, like, unless you're aligned with one of those with us and the province, we, going back to the original submission by, uh, you know, the divisions, uh, we wouldn't, uh, we aren't in a position to actually uh, support bricks and mortar and tenant improvements unless it's aligned with an IH service. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Tony, I see, or sorry, I'm sorry, Director Boot. Thank Your name you, says Tony on the screen. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right, it does. Uh, and it's my name, so that's okay. Uh, I just wanted to verify that I'm understanding something um, that Dan said a minute ago. And um, I'm talking specifically about the Summerland Center or the proposed center. Um, but this would go for all primary care networks. Um, in what you said, if there is um, the, the doctors and the allied health and nurse practitioners working together as a primary care center, then that not that necessarily that probably will not be getting any funding through um, the Ministry of Health through IH. Um, I think I heard that, and but my question, I guess, really is um, if if you could clarify what you said in terms of the difference that may come as far as funding goes if interior health itself has space in the facility um so you're talking about if if the space that the primary care clinic um is would be within an ih facility um well, kind of. I'm wondering if uh, if the primary care network is in a facility and there is also space that um, is, I guess, owned by or leased to Interior Health, if there is some way of um, supporting funding from IH for that model uh, I, I'd say that it's a possibility for sure I, I think I think we'd need to understand the the sort of the whole picture a little bit more but I think um, what I will say is you know the Ministry of Health has asked um, interior health to um, get the primary care network set up um, across the region and, and it takes different forms depending on the region um, if, if in a particular area, the, the network uh, plan requires the use of, of space um, that would be in an interior health location and has interior health services in it, then, and, and there's a capital component, say you just need to um, redevelop um, a series of offices into more of a patient um, area, um, then that, that would be capital and it would be something we would look at um, trying to to fund um, whether it's the ministry or whether it's um, IH using part of our sort of our more global capital allocation for it um, I mean when it comes to the primary care networks the ministry hasn't um, necessarily provided the health authorities with specific capital funding because I think the concept is more has more been around the network and not necessarily setting up a, a bunch of bricks and mortar clinics um, which is more where the UPCCs kind of come in, I guess, um, in terms of them actually providing capital for that. So um, in a roundabout way, uh, does that help answer your question, uh, Director Boot? But, and, and I'll just, sorry, answer, uh, and I will just add a little small little bit to that. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so what we're talking about here is in situ uh, uh, staffing budgets and IH providing staff, and then we're talking about services. So regardless, it doesn't matter where a physician office is, they still would access interior health services, whether it's home care, long-term care. We've been working a lot with the divisions around those transitions. So that's the service delivery aspects of care. And it doesn't matter where a physician is. It's when the physician office is going to have staff of IH, which are unionized, 
insituated within a team that is uh, that is what we're talking about around capital dollars and the improvement to advance one of the key ministry strategies. So and it's, you know, like uh, Tracy had said, uh, physicians are independent business people. So, you know, and they can hire who they want and do, you know, hire whatever they want. But when they're looking at an, a, a suite of allied services, allied health as in social workers, OTs and PTs, that is our work and if it's going to be in situ in in situ in a building then it is that um that collaboration between the divisions so but for the purpose of this discussion and what the uh the divisions uh, tracy and tim had presented uh to the to the board uh they're asking for the support for the building which we would absolutely support and then the suite of primary care services uh within home and community would all be supporting that uh, like i said it doesn't matter what's in the building. It's when you want the staff from IH and situated in the building that it becomes um, a different model. That's, that's a question I'm asking. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks, Carl. I think Tracy has something to add to that conversation as well. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up down on what you said about um, uh, the bricks and mortar and the capital. So we, I, I still believe we're the only, Ponderos is the only um, clinic that did get capital in primary care networks, so we're not anticipating that model will come around again. I think we just lucked out. Um, and in terms of the scenario in Summerland, um, I, as I understand it, it is a, a, the vision would be a larger partnership that would include primary care but other services as well. And um, we had, uh, from a primary care network standpoint, we do anticipate that there will, in each community, um, be allied health and nurses hired by IH working alongside uh, private physicians, um, independent physicians. And that's where it gets tricky. And, and I was just waiting you, for you, Dan, when you said about the process under the Hospital Act to designate a, a facility as a, I can't remember what you called it, um, officially, and I said, and IH wants to hold the leases on all these clinics. That would be that would just tie it up in a bow. But I don't think we're in that um, place, and I don't think in Summerland, for example, if there's um, two or three allied health and and twelve doctors, fourteen doctors in a primary care clinic, um, I don't anticipate that Interior Health is looking to hold the lease on that whole space, um, and that's where. We do uh, with Ponderosa. It's basically almost like a rent situation where each provider is paying their portion of the rent, including Interior Health for the the staff that they have in there. So I think that's where we kind of we're relying on partnerships, and and the systems are structured around you own this and I own this, and um, they're not really structured around the kind of collaboration that we're trying to do in the South Okanagan. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Dr. Phillips mentioned earlier that it's kind of like a private-public partnership type thing. And so that's, I mean, that's where we're still deliberating and deliberating, deliberating if that's something that this board um, is able to and would like to figure out how to offer funding support towards. So Director Roberts' hand is up next. Thank you to the chair. Uh, just wondering in regards to clarity's sake, uh, the model that is in Karameas, is this something that kind of touches all those? Because we have an interior health building, we have all the allied health in the facility, but it's also the doctor's office. And with primary uh, care network coming into the area, there is a look at changing some of the structural um, you know, the way some of the parts of the building is set up so that the PCM can fit. Is, is this something about, you know, that kind of mirrors a little bit of what Director Boot was um, asking about? Throw that over to whoever feels they can answer that one. Um, there's, which clinic are you referring to in Karameas? Interior Health. The hospital. 
We, we only have one. We have the okay. South Samil Community Health Center, which is also the doctor's office, which is somewhat of an urgent care, which yeah. is a, you know, blah, blah, blah. Only because we have, no, only because we have, I'm, I'm the ED for mental health and a bunch of other buildings in, in the south of yeah. Port Orgas, so I just want to make sure. Um, yeah, so my understanding is that is uh, an IH owned and operated uh, facility. And um, of course, they've got a, an eMERGE and various other things. And so to me, that is um, the physicians are, I would assume, Tracy fee for service under that model. Yeah. Do you know? They, yeah. 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 Yes. So they're coming into IH space, providing a service much like the physicians at Penticton or South Okanagan would do, or more so um, So for South Okanagan, the physicians that work in that area are fee for service, and they provide services and are privileged to work in our buildings. Correct, and, and I think too with Carmius and Princeton, they're both in that model and recognizing that they're rural communities, which tend to be harder to recruit into. And so I think you've seen, a, a, again, each community has a slightly different model depending on what that community need is. Yeah, and we've talked about that as a group um, with divisions over the last year or so, how the solution, whatever the solution may be, is not the same for each community. It's going to look different in each community, which is why we or someone needs to be flexible. Um, are there any other, I don't see any hands on the board, nor do I see any up in the air. Are there any other questions? Director Bauer. Director Bauer. Yeah, thanks. Since uh, you mentioned Caramius, uh, I think uh, a, a few facts should be uh, mentioned. For instance, that uh, the regional hospital district owned the property where this facility sits on now. The community raised about three quarter million dollars through the medical foundation to make it happen and it is a uh, private uh, public collaboration between the ih between community service society that we have a dementia unit in there assisted uh, living in there and uh, this is actually a really good example of private community and public collaboration from the get go. So, uh, if this was possible in other communities and uh, like Oliver or Soyuz or wherever, then I think this is the way to go. But communities have to understand too, there has to be some uh, input from the community, whether it's fundraising or whether it's volunteering or, you know, a lot of volunteer hours and uh, fundraising went into this unit to uh, make it the health center it is now. And uh, I feel also that the uh, fact that we have five doctors now uh, is testimony to the um, support that the community has lent and showed the doctors that uh, the whole community wants them here and what we have to offer. So there is a lot that goes with uh, creating this kind of thing. It is not just uh, putting tax dollars out there. You need a lot more than that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, I don't see any hands right now, so I have a yeah. question and I'm not sure oh, I saw a hand pop up. Director Gittins, go ahead. You can go ahead. I can play the paper. No, no, it's okay. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to clarify with the UPCCs, because you had mentioned, Dan, that they're in Kamloops, Kelowna, and West Kelowna. What is the population of the area? Or, like, those are bigger centers. That's, like, not like an Oliver with Kamloops. So what's the likelihood of a UPCC showing up in Oliver or... Um, I'll try my best to answer, and Carl, please jump in. Um... So we also, in addition to Kamloops, um, uh, Kelowna, West Kelowna, um, there is one in Vernon, and again another larger center. Uh, there's also one in Castlegar, um, and so, and I believe there's still more possibly to come. Um, and so, um, I, I do believe that they uh, that population is a factor, of course, um, but I don't think it's the only factor. Um, and it's too bad we don't have um, 
uh, uh, someone from our, our uh, primary community care transformation team on the call today um, to sort of be able to describe the process more. But it, it, it kind of, I think it's a combination of population, but also um, need for service in that particular community. Um, you know, is there um, the, the attachment piece is one of one element of it. Um, uh, marginalized populations is, is another. Um, so, um, and, and I would say, Dan, increase access around hours. So we're trying to take the uh, population is a factor because you're trying to take pressure off the less acute clients that um, are accessing, um, you know, our eMERGE departments, but it's called, the lingo is called longitudinal care. So while they all share that they want, we want to attach people to primary care physicians or nurse practitioners, uh, urgent primary care is really so that somebody uh, can access uh, urgent care, not have to go to the eMERGE department and then be attached in that system and again with for us uh it, with a population focus and uh, and so it's a it's a kind of a, a blended model but tracy you me tim everybody's uh all fully into this discussion now uh with the divisions but anything to add so there's a special population part and then extended hours uh, improved access and then longitudinal care and attaching people to the services that they need through the upcc so any of the population can access it, whereas the Ponderosa Clinic, they are known clients, right? So it's really a, a, a you know, a, it's 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 different. Thank yeah, I would think that. that. Sorry, I, I would think that matches it. Castle Guard does have a UPCC. It's actually set up kind of across the hallway from their eMERGE department, so that the lower acuity um, urgent stuff gets seen in the UPCC and not in the emergency department. Um, so that's the only kind of smaller community within the health authority at the moment um, that has a UPCC that I'm aware of. So if I can follow up with that, because I just wanted to check, we had this conversation July 16th, and the recommendation from the administrative report was to develop a policy to provide a flexible funding program. So when we have some of these rural communities that are hard to recruit into, we have some way to support providing what would be attractive to family doctors. And then when we talked about this as a board, there were a lot of questions and we wanted to ask IH to come and join us so that we could hear if it makes sense to support recruiting family physicians at a local level. And I just wanted to make sure that we're gonna talk about that as well because that's what it, what we're here for is to discuss the regional hospital district, our participation in physician recruitment. And what I see on the ground when I'm working in recruitment is that it's hard to recruit into smaller areas when we don't have the space for them. And when you're in a rural area and your eMERGE department is staffed by family doctors, it's quite critical to make sure we have a good flow of family doctors and a good number of family doctors to provide that service. So if there, if we're not on a list of clinics that could possibly be going in from IH, because that's what I think I'm hearing you say, Carl, is that IH is not going to go build clinics for family doctors. In rural areas, it's the family doctors that work at eMERGE. So if you don't have the clinics for the family doctors, you're going to have a problem with your eMERGE or your urgent care in rural areas. Is that, is that, any, is that right? Yeah, so... We struggled with that in Penticton as well. I mean, we have what they call a community inpatient service, which, but one of that, uh, the, the vision, and Tracy clearly was one of the architects of that vision, was that um, that the physicians, that we wanted the physicians to be in primary care and GPs and not going to a hospitalist model that not only for taxpayers was going to be extremely exorbitant and expensive, but so we, we, we have been known for innovation. But for a smaller community, the uh, the the fact of building a, a, a community physician office uh, just wouldn't it. it I, we haven't seen it. Uh, there would have to be a, a, a pretty 
compelling reason of how that would change things. But for you, you've just hit the nail on the head, Riley. This is about physician recruitment and making sure that our communities are suited to actually support both uh, emergency or GPs in the in the hospitals and GPs in the community. Because if one is more lucrative than the other, the physicians are going to go. And I'm not sorry, Tim. I'm not going to speak, but generally you go where you know where where you've got uh, you know the best for yourself. And so we want to make sure we're not having areas that are competing against each other for GPs but uh, or nurse practitioners. Um, Tracy, Kim? Nothing to add. Yeah, well, I was just going to, um, just um, following up on what uh, the, the conversation that Director Gettins brought up and um, followed up with Carl. This just brings us back to um, what the CAO started off the meeting, suggesting that this discussion came about as a result of our 2019 business plan, when the board indicated that access to healthcare providers in the South Okanagan and Sonoma community was of interest, and that they would like to explore regional district participation in physician recruitment. So it's a conversation that we continue to have. Is it, is it something that is still important to us as a board? Um, and if so, what is what is the best way to move forward with supporting the primary care networks in our rural communities, acknowledging that they're going to look different in each community. Um, the, the needs, we know, the needs in Karameas are different than the needs in Penticton. And so how can we be flexible if this is important to us, if we see the recruitment of primary care physicians as being a quality of life issue um, for our residents, and how do we best support that as a board? So I see Director Gittin's hands up, hand up. I feel like it's a leftover hand. Yeah, and it is. Um, we have the opportunity to have um, multiple people here to answer as many questions as we have before we um, wrap this conversation up and take it back to our next board meeting while we're, we'll deliver it once again. Um, so are there any other questions for anyone? Interior Health Divisions, uh, to clarify, are there any any lingering issues? No? Director Gettins? Sorry, I'm just going to put this up there again, because again in July, there were a lot of questions about, is this what we're planning on doing, or what we're discussing as the board? Does this align with IH? Would IH be in support of it? Like, there, were, there was a really good discussion last July, so I just want to echo again, if you've got everybody in the room right now to ask those questions to make sure that this does, and that it does help overall with our healthcare needs for our community. So I think there are some good questions and good people to answer them right now. Look around this table. I haven't turned this <laughs> yet. No? No? no. <laughs> Does it okay. help to talk? more specifically, like I'm, I'm just thinking we actually since uh, uh, Dr. Phillips and I were here last time um, have looked uh, a little bit more detail at opportunities. So Summerland is definitely a, a continuing conversation. Um, Oliver, quite frankly, is our biggest um, risk area right now. Um, we had to retire. We had two physicians leave practice this year. Um, and the main, and they're young, and the main reason that they left was because um, of the burden of working in hospital and in the office, and there's not enough pitching in for emergency department, for example, that if somebody gets sick, um, you have no coverage. Like, you're, there's just no, the group is too small. And so what's happened in Oliver is that two clinics have joined together um, because they could not operate with the numbers that they had in two separate clinics. And we've got six doctors working in a small clinic with six operating er, uh, exam rooms. Um, and when you think of, in when you go to the doctor, your doctor's usually um, using two exam rooms. And so you can imagine the number of in-person appointments that takes you down to. And so then to recruit, there are a number of physicians, a lot of them from Alberta right now, with um, the climate in Alberta, who are, are quite seriously shopping, looking around, looking to move. And um, in Oliver, there is, there is nowhere, really, that you can recruit into. 
And so you have a shortage, and with the space issue, nowhere to reliably recruit into. So we have start to, started to scope um, uh, potential space. We're looking at um, being able to uh, renovate an existing space to the tune of about $750,000. We get you the renovation. Um, we've got the uh, um, medical foundation is definitely interested. They need to partner up. So we it feels like we're at this chicken and egg. Who's going to blink first? Um, we've got uh, a number of physicians, as I said, who are already in a clinic. The lease is coming up. So you've got kind of your um, revenue stream once you open. Um, as you know, with Ponderosa, we've talked about it before. Um, it's, uh, it covers itself. Once you're open, um, your tenants cover the cost of running the clinic. So it really is that initial startup phase um, that we're stuck around. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, 10 years ago, a physician would start their own office. They would build, they'd put their own capital in. Um, not only are we not seeing that, we're having a hard time recruiting into a, um, a traditional family practice, um, type of practice at the best of times. Um, because there is competition. There are UPCCs where you can go and work on contract. There's hospital, uh, hospitalist lines where you go in at um, seven in the morning, you're done at three, and somebody else takes over the patients. When you're a family doctor in a small community, those are your patients seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So if we can't get doctors working in a group, I, I don't know what that future looks like. And it's not just our communities, it's all across the province. But that's really what we're up against in terms of when, when somebody expresses interest in coming into our community, there's a young woman right now who would, would love to work in Oliver, provide maternity care. We know we're soon losing a physician in Oliver who does provide the majority of the maternity care. There's no space right now. The very earliest we can look at having her join is in the uh, next summer. So it's, it's, I can't, anyways, I don't want to, that's just the environment that we're in. And so any brainstorming around how you get the willing partners um, to start investing in, yeah, and getting together to invest in a long-term investment for your community. And I and think the idea would be, you know, some situation where your community is holding a lease on these clinics and we've seen it. Um, uh, Gabriel Island, they did that, uh, no doctors, and now they have three doctors, and, and the community does that. So that's the type of situation that is, um, we're, we're seeing success in recruiting into that we're trying to replicate. Thank you for that. And that um, isn't just for Oliver and Asoyas, it's for Princeton and Karameas and all those other areas in the South Okanagan. Yeah, I think when we saw the original plan, and it was a while ago, so things are fluid and things change, but we were looking at a minimum of five primary care clinics kind of throughout the region, possibly more, depending on intake need. Um, Director Roberts, I see your hand up again. Thank you to the chair. And just to you know, support Ms. St. Clair's statements of the urgency around Oliver, coming from the perspective of being a person that works with BC Ambulance, knowing what it's like to cover multiple times we look after a soyuz, which means we deal with maybe taking somebody off or anarchist and coming down and it's LLTO, which is life limb um, threatened organisms, which means then if there's no issue, there's no doctor on the ER in the evening, um, we're taking somebody with, you know, let's say, uh, something fairly minor, but they're having to work their way back home, but we're taking them all the way to Penticton. Uh, and then again, that stretches out in regards to our services as an emergency service, because all of a sudden now uh, we were already brought into the South Okanagan because there was a car down or a car used. And then now we're going and leaving the South, going right up to Penticton, and again, putting more strain and stress. And again, to support uh, Director Bauer's statement, again, yes, the, the, and uh, Ms. St. Clair's regards to community involvement, because it really was the community of Karameas that uh, 
really put a lot of work, effort, and financing support uh, behind the South Samil Community Health Centre, which we are all very proud of. Thank you, Director Roberts. Um, any other questions? Last opportunity. So I think I think what I've heard, just to summarize from our presenters, is that primary care clinics, the ones that we're talking about right now, the ones that we've been talking about for the last couple of years, um, the plans that be, are being created for, you know, Summerland, Penticton, all of our cities, all the way over to Princeton, um, which will almost solely house primary care physicians um, with the addition of the allied health that will come with the primary care network. Those are not clinics that are being built by Interior Health. Those would need to be a community-led initiative um, in some way, shape, or form, whatever that looks like. So that's what I've heard. And uh, don't know if nobody else has anything to say, then we will thank our presenters um, for all of the information that they've given us. And I look forward to continuing this conversation next month. Uh, so thanks. Thanks to all four of you. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's hanging on the line. Well, I know Joanna is for sure for our next presentation. And, and um, Petra, if you, if you need us back, please, uh, we, that's what we're here for. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Thanks for coming. Bye. So our next, uh, our next pres presenter is Joanna Harrison, um, long-term care executive director. Oh, I'll stay, I'll stay on. Center. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it's too good to miss. Uh, Senior Specialized Care Transformation is also, um, this presentation is also coming to us as a result of a request made at our last board meeting, but uh, again, I'll turn things over to the CEO for further presentation. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So uh, I think generally the operation of extended care facilities has been a concern, uh, not only in our area, but uh, I mean, it's a national uh, or international issue. Uh, but it has certainly been exacerbated by uh, COVID-19 and, and the deleterious effect uh, that the pandemic has had on those uh, uh, living in extended care. So it came to the hospital board as to uh, whether we wanted to stick our nose into this and uh, advocate for more provincial involvement uh, in the operation or ownership of extended care. Uh, there has been that transition from uh, public operation over to private operation and uh, some of the egregious circumstances that have come to light during the pandemic. Uh, so that was the interest in having uh, IHA attend uh, was to uh, see if they have a plan or if uh, there is going to be some intervention uh, provincially into the operation of extended care facilities. Thank you. So I'll turn things over to um, Joanna Harrison. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, and good morning. I'm actually uh, in smoky Kamloops today, so I don't think it's any different than anywhere else. <laughs> Um, I just, uh, in terms of the long-term care, I'm not sure how much has been shared around the new um, buildings that have been announced through the minister. So we do have the 90 beds that have been announced for Penticton region through an RFP process um, that is currently going through the bidding and evaluation stages. So that um, is still in progress and will not be completed until November. Um, they were one of five other uh, bids that had gone forward um, that was announced through the ministry in July. Um, so those particular bills are what we would have termed that um, public private partnership. So these are bills that are be contracted out to private organizations, um, but maintain the funded beds for our clients within them. So I'm not sure what else you want me to go through on that, Joe, or Carl? 
it may be good to just explain uh, the difference between you and I. So I'm the executive director for all clinical operations across South Okanagan, including long-term care, assisted living, adult day, and everything. And Joanna is the executive director of the strategy and the transformation team, seniors transformation. So there may be some questions for South Okanagan specifically, and then there may be around the questions around the strategy, the long-term care strategy that Joe has uh, meets with the ministry and she has that uh, overarching view of interior health. So maybe that might just help people in thinking mm -hmm. of who's gonna answer what question. Thank you. Um, so do we have any questions at all? Uh, it's Dan here. I'll maybe just jump in if that's okay. Um, just in terms of, and, and I think this is probably in reference to the most recent uh, or, or related to the most recent uh, board chairs meeting we had um, with all the RHDs and interior health back in the spring, I think. Um, and certainly there's been, uh, this government had um, had indicated that they, they wanted the health authorities to do, um, to look into more or uh, what it would take and what's involved in um, uh, when it comes to new uh, long-term care beds and, and replacing uh, old uh, stock of beds um, to to look at both the uh, IH owned and operated or health authority owned and operated options versus um, contracting out services. So um, we, we continue to do that. Um, and I, and um, I think, as Joe mentioned, there are some that we are uh, still going to contract on uh, as directed by the ministry. Um, um, but we are still looking at um, sort of continuing and, and perhaps expanding the owned and operate inside as well. Um, I haven't heard much discussion. Maybe this is where Joe and Carl, you can jump in in terms of uh, interior health concerns with um, our partner providers, uh, um, particularly in the context of COVID and, and some of the issues being raised across Canada and the world probably as well. Um, so at this point in time, I'm not aware of, of, of those concerns. I mean, we have um, um, uh, interior health licensing, ensuring that the facilities are are up to standards that we would expect um, and if there are issues then um, we do get involved as far as helping to um, resolve any challenges that a site might be facing in terms of recruiting their staff or um, any any other uh, uh, concerns that might have been flagged um, whether by families of, of residents in that area um, or or uh, any other any other source there I can say, I mean, Dan, it's, it's, a, oh, yeah, okay, I just wanted to make sure I'm off mute. Most people know that uh, one of our facilities has been taken over uh, by an administrator. Um, so like Dan says, regardless of whether you're owned and operated or private, you still have to follow licensing and various other things. Uh, the, dif the distinct difference is we don't hire their staff, we don't negotiate their collective agreements. So there are some significant um, challenges uh, at times. And so, um, but again, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that we aren't uh, following them. Right, uh, the wage uh, differential between private and public was a challenge, uh, and so it was very challenging for private providers to provide uh, and maintain safe staffing levels in some cases because of the wage disparity. Uh, the challenge is because the ministry moved in during COVID and gave them wage disparity, and then put a single site order. Guess where our community health workers have moved to, and which is decreasing our access to community health workers, which are also healthcare assistants. So. There's, it's been a very tough, um, a tough few months from the recruitment side uh, uh, across uh, communities, including long-term care and various other things. So, thank you. Um, yeah, and those, I mean, that explanation kind of hit the nail on the head. I think uh, in regards to our previous conversation back in July, just with all of the issues that have been in the media, um, obviously issues that have existed for a long time, but have been exacerbated by COVID and our current situation um, with long-term care facilities in other parts of the country and even in some parts of our own province. Um, we just, you know, we're having a conversation about what what is the difference between private um, and public uh, facilities here in our region. 
Um, how are the um, contracted facilities monitored? Um, is the monitoring sufficient? Um, are there things that, uh, that we're learning throughout this process, things that could be done better? Um, those, those sorts of questions. Uh, Director Gettins. Thanks to the chair. Yeah, I thought that was um, a good summary, actually, um, Chair, about why we were having this conversation, because I think COVID definitely showed us some of the room for improvement with how, um, especially when we're on this world world stage with COVID and, and how that impacted our long-term care facilities compared to other countries. And I, I'm just thinking of Australia because we've got family there and they didn't see the, the increase that we saw here in COVID and just they talked, there was a lot of discussion in the media about um, how we could improve. And I think it's great that we're getting more beds. I think that's definitely helpful. I do think that again, recruiting into those, again, that's another challenge of bringing in the people. So um, when, um, sorry, I just said, Joanna, when he said about the 90 new beds, is that in Penticton, is that a new long-term care facility that's going to be built in Penticton? And that's going to be ran by the ministry and it's not going to be privatized. It, uh, that building will be similar to, I don't want to use the word Summerland as an example, but it comes straight to my head um, about public private partnerships. So it's not an IH building. It is a privately built own building with their um, staff within it. Um, but we fund beds in long-term care so that they, we wrap around our services and our support and legislation and licensing. So they're, I don't want to use the word our residents, but we're responsible for the residents within those sites. So we will have that oversight according to those um, partnerships and the residents within them. Um, so I don't know if that helps. And Riley, just I'll just add to that. Um, we actually in in South Okanagan and Penticton are actually needing special care beds. So Joanne and I have been having conversations because the RFP didn't. It, you know, it's it's uh, the it went out as basically the your bed your long term care bed uh, model. But we actually our need here is not more beds necessarily. It's more special care beds uh, for clients with dementia and various other things. So we're working through that and advocating from that front but um yeah and if it's okay i'll just i just want to also speak around because we know that the nationally internationally even with provincially within the province around the covid and the covid response for our long-term care homes um i have been sharing and trying to share widely the good news um that to date in interior health we still do not have a single positive case of a resident with covid19 which is phenomenal and needs to be celebrated. Um, we hear a lot of bad rap, bad news, bad, you know, this, what can we do better? But sometimes there, there's some positive in there. There's something to be said about what it is we are doing and we're doing right. Um, so, and I think what we're doing, we're doing a lot of oversight. We're doing a lot of, um, um, again, I call it wrapping. It's not just um, interior health um, or licensing just doing this or PCQO, you know, patient care quality office doing one thing. We're all coming together as a group. I think our relationships have really grown through COVID. It's another positive thing in light of a very challenging environment where we're really coming together and starting to communicate better, sharing knowledge, sharing information. So I think we'll see some positive things, more positive things come out of that and we'll further strengthen that oversight in our long-term care homes. I would also add that we've had heart-wrenching sides of this COVID, particularly with our frail seniors. And, um, you know, it's it's actually been very tough on us as staff yeah. to have to, you know, it's, it's more of a moral debate around, you know, what's worse, dying alone or dying of COVID. And so it's it's been very sad and uncomfortable for many of us. And it's it's really been an aching conversation on so many fronts. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, and thanks for sharing the good news. Um, I think that I think that about answers the questions that we seemed to have the last time around. Um, if there are any direct gettings, is your hand left over? Excellent. Are there any other questions for our presenters? No, I don't see any. So thank you again very much to all of you for joining us. Thanks again for hanging on for that extra half an hour or so at the beginning. We appreciate your time, um, and that's, you. that's it for today. So I will look for a motion to adjourn. 
And Thanks as always. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Thank, Thank you. Uh, all in favor? And any opposed? Nope, we're adjourned. Thank you. And, th and that's it. I'll turn it back over to the. Is there nope, anything else? We're, we're done? We're done. Okay, we're done. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah. See you in a couple weeks.